کی جان نکل گئی اسی وجہ سے اب ٹھیک ہے جی بالکل زبردست ہے اور میں آپ سب کا خیر مقدم کرتا ہوں آج خان امبیسڈ کانگریس میں یہ پروگرام چونکہ انگریزی میں ہوگا تو تھوڑے سے ابتدائی کلمات کے بعد ہم شفٹ ہو جائیں گے انگریزی زبان کے اندر ویلکم یو آل سیونٹی فورتھ انڈیپینڈنس ڈے آف پاکستان آن دس اسپیشل پوپتھان امبیسڈر کانگریس گوئنگ ٹو انٹروڈیوس اینڈ وی ول بی انٹروڈیوسنگ ایچ ادر ان دا نیکسٹ فیو منٹس وٹ بیفور دس ہیپنس وی آر گوئنگ ٹو رن approvals documentary as it is going to explain how the world's largest microfinance organization shaped up in the last 20 years. Let's play the documentary and watch how a coup is changing millions of lives in Pakistan. Welcome to our blue planet Earth, inhabiting closer to 8 billion souls. Humans were created equal spiritually and biologically, yet they became different when classified into the rich or the poor, the haves and the have-nots. In today's world, while the rich relish every moment of their life in taste, luxury, style and speed, the poor crawl in hunger, illness and misery. Pakistan, the world's fifth most populated country, has been fighting with the challenge of poverty since its inception. In 2005, as per World Bank stats, almost half the country's population lived under the poverty line. Poverty means waking up every day feeling insecure, hungry, irrelevant and small. While the poor yearn for food and shelter, they equally wish for a hug and a pat on the back from their fellow humans. A Kuwat, a brotherhood of haves and have-nots, a not-for-profit organization was founded in 2001 on the Islamic finance model. The organization started with the donation of US $100 equivalent, loaned to a poor widow who was looking for a helping hand, not charity. Akuwat founders believed in the maxim, give a hungry person a fish and you feed him or her for a day. Teach a hungry person how to fish and you feed him or her for a lifetime. So, they thought to do the impossible by teaching the poor the art of entrepreneurship. Monies were raised, donations were made and dispersed among the poor men and women who successfully transformed their lives. 
Today, Akuwat has expanded to include over 1,000 branches in 400 cities of Pakistan. A microloan portfolio of over 750 million US dollars active loans and a recovery rate of 99.9%. With over 10,000 volunteers, over 100,000 donors, 3.5 million beneficiary families, and approximately 115 billion rupees. Akuwat is becoming the world's largest interest-free microfinance organization. Akuwat's unique model is being studied at Harvard, Stanford, Cambridge, Oxford, and other leading universities. Akuwat has been recognized on several global platforms, including the Global Economic Forum and the United Nations. I invite each awardee to join me on stage when I call their name. Muhammad Amjad Saki. Akuwat is pioneering a new approach to microfinance that is both financially sustainable and compatible with Islamic finance. Through its core program of interest-free microfinance, Akuwat has dispersed around $600 million in loans amongst the poor that have been utilized to launch or expand small businesses. It also operates services for transgender people, health clinics, low-cost schools, and a tuition-free university. Please join me in celebrating the winner of the Lifetime Achievement Award, Dr. Amjad Saqib, founder of Akuwat. I'm uh, Dr. Amjad. First of all, you have the program of Akuwat, the microfinance program of the most important thing to help और ये जो आ, उनको मौका देने के लिए अपने घर बनाने का मैं आपको खास तौर पर मुबारक देता हूं और आपको खराज तहसीन इसलिए पेश करता हूं क्योंकि मैंने आपका काफी देर तक फॉलो किया आपकी अकूबत की परफॉर्मेंस ये जब आ, हमारे पास आपके ये प्रपोजल आई कि आपको हम फाइनेंस करें तो उससे पहले मैं आपको फॉलो कर रहा था कि मैंने जितने भी चैरिटीज जितने भी एनजीओस काम करते रहे हैं पाकिस्तान में उनको मैं देखता रहा हूं सालों से और आपका बड़ा क्रेडिबल नाम था जो आपने अभी दिखाया भी क्योंकि एक एक खराती ادارے की कामयाबी का सबसे बड़ा राज यह होता है कि लोग लोगों को इत्मीनान हो उसके ऊपर उस पर ट्रांसपेरेंसी और उस पे उसकी क्रेडिबिलिटी इसके अलावा कभी भी आप पैसा नहीं इकट्ठा कर सकते ज्यादा देर तक लोग थोड़ी देर के लिए पैसा इकट्ठा कर लेंगे अकॉर्डिंग टू द वर्ल्ड बैंक पॉवर्टी इन पाकिस्तान फेल फ्रॉम 64.3% इन 2002 टू 29.5% इन 2014 विद योर सपोर्ट Pakistan has made substantial progress in reducing poverty giving it the second lowest headcount poverty rate in South Asia the world-famous Wall Street Journal has filmed an exclusive documentary on Akuwat, looking into its life-transforming journey. If we want to upscale Sharia-compliant finance, then the role of the state bank and role of the state are very, very critical. So without that, you know, you cannot give a real impetus to this. Akuwat has also expanded into several other projects. Please read out the infograph. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, this is Kesra Abbas. I am the co founder of Opathan along with Arif Anis. And I'm very excited to be here with you. I feel honored to be able to open this session along with Arif Anis and other senior colleagues. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is uh, a time of unprecedented crisis. And I was uh, studying about crisis in the dictionary and the dictionary says a crisis is a time of intense difficulty or danger. 
And then I went to study the medical terminology and it says uh, crisis is a time in a patient's life. It's a turning point actually. So the patient actually can get worse or can get better. And when I went to Greek, Greeks say that the crisis is actually a decision. Crisis means a decision. So when I put everything together, what I understand from crisis is that crisis is an intense situation of danger and difficulty and where your decision can actually be a turning point. So today we have uh, this uh, Ambassador's Congress of Hope, some of the best minds of diplomatic world. And we're going to learn from all of these uh, uh, high profile speakers how we can actually take an advantage of this crisis and turn this into an opportunity. With me is uh, my, my colleague uh, Arif Anis, who is uh, uh, officially going to launch the entire thing. And he's going to host this, this uh, four hours long uh, uh, conversation and dialogue. And Arif Anis is a writer based in London. Uh, he's an executive coach, he's an author, he's worked with the CEOs and executives of Fortune 500 companies. Uh, he's written best selling book, I'm Possible and Follow Your Dreams. Uh, his new book uh, is coming out in the next couple of days. And this actually is uh, uh, written in the same context. The title is Lee, uh, Made in Crisis. And Arif Anis uh, was uh, one of those uh, 100 people who were recognized as the uh, top 100 British. He also serves as uh, an economic senator in European uh, uh, Senate. And Arif Anis uh, uh, has been supporting a lot of uh, initiatives. He's a trustee uh, with a forward in UK. And Arif Anis uh, was in 2009 uh, given the award of Global Man of the Year 2019 by Global Magazine. Join me in welcoming Arif Anis. Arif Anis, over to you. Thank you so much. Um, there we are. Right. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Thank you so much, Kaisa. And I'm so grateful there. There's been a lot of glowing words. Uh, Kaiser Abbas himself uh, is the co author of the book Made in Crisis and Pakistan's uh, foremost recognized executive coach and a best selling writer and a leader's leader. So we both uh, conceived the concept of the Hopathon and we present you Hopathon Ambassadors Congress, which is an exclusive presentation for the 74th day of independence of Pakistan. We have uh, the privilege of having some of the best minds from the diplomatic world, as Kaiser mentioned. Um, so today, before we actually start the program officially, we have some 10, 12 minutes will be, I'll be quickly introducing the panel, uh, the panel of uh, two uh, Kaiser and myself, and then uh, we have got two distinguished guests with us. Um, these two people, without them, this program, this Hobarton Ambassadors Congress wouldn't have taken place. So I would take a bit of time to introduce themselves. I'll be introducing uh, Farad Asif in first place. Uh, Farad is um, Global Change Leaders Fellow, Cody Institute from Cody Institute Canada, and NPC Award winner from UNDP Asia Pacific. She's the founder president of the Institute of Peace and Diplomatic Studies, IPDS Islamabad. Uh, this institute is our strategic partner in this program. We're so grateful for, for their collaboration. It was established in 2014. It's a Pakistan-based independent, non-governmental, not-for-profit research advocacy and public diplomacy. Think and do tank. So they don't only think, but they do as well. And this program is one of uh, the evidence. Uh, Farad is um, an award-winning human rights and peace activist by choice, um, public diplomat by experience, researcher and writer by profession. She has done amazing work, uh, particularly uh, for, uh, for women empowerment with well niched diplomatic engagements in Pakistan and across the globe. Farad has pioneered the public diplomacy initiatives in Pakistan through the promotion of culture, education and business connections amongst the communities across the globe. She's also global change leader and I mentioned the Institute, uh, Cody Institute again. So Farad, we welcome you on board and I'll be quickly introducing our very special guest, a uh, very special guest for a reason because uh, he has led and uh, pioneered Pakistan's 
the biggest initiative rather that has become now the world's biggest initiative in the field of microfinance. Uh, Dr. Muhammad, um, Muhammad um, the Sakib, Dr. Sakib has been uh, a CSP, the Civil Service of Pakistan, uh, an illustrious one with a great career. And he actually uh, left the Civil Services of Pakistan to initiate, to, to found a Hobart, a Hobart Pakistan that as um, you watch the documentary, it has become the world's largest macrofinance institution, more than $750 million loan distributed among more than 4 million recipients. Uh, Dr. Saab has um, uh, not only, this is not the only credentials, Dr. Saab is a consultant to the United Nations and a much sought after consultant by the World Bank and several world and global institutions of higher uh, learning. Uh, Dr. Saab's influence, uh, particularly in this field, has been um, one of the great success stories in Pakistan. Uh, Ahobat has been one of the pinnacle point of uh, staging Hopatan one, two, three, and also now the fourth. So welcome Farhat Asif and Dr. Mohammad Amjad Saqib. Uh, you, you both, um, uh, we have a few minutes before uh, the word the ambassador, and actually I'll be uh, taking this time to welcome uh, our, our ambassador of the Un United States, Ambassador Jones, who actually joined us as well. Uh, welcome, sir. And before we get there, let's, um, uh, let's go to Farhat and Dr. Mohammad Amjad Saqib. Uh, Right, um, Dr. Saab, uh, this is the 74th day of independence and we are with uh, the ambassadors of the 12 friendly countries of Pakistan. So how is this 14th of August going for you in Akhobat? You created one of the biggest success story um, in the country. So how would you like to pass on your message on this important day? Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim thank you very much. Uh, uh, Arif Anis, uh, extremely grateful for your kind words and a very kind introduction. And I would like to welcome Kaisar Abbas, our friend, and uh, uh, Ms. Farhat Asif, uh, the brilliant, uh, you have introduced her. Uh, so, you know, uh, I would also like to take this opportunity to thank our um, friends uh, from your different countries, the ambassadors, his excellencies, for finding this time and giving a message of hope. Uh, Hobart represents hope. Hobart uh, means solidarity with the poor, with the underprivileged, with the marginalized communities. And it's a universal concept that how can we all work together to create a better world, a world where everybody has the opportunity to realize his or her potential. So as I mentioned, it means solidarity, our love, our sharing, our care with the downtrodden, so in that <clears throat> sense, we you know, uh, established the, uh, a fund uh, which was contributed by the philanthropist and uh, that fund was utilized for uh, giving small loans, tiny loans to the poor people to start their business or expand an existing business. The unique thing is <clears throat> that it is different from other conventional microfinance programs. We don't charge any kind of interest or service uh, cost from the borrowers. So in a two sense, it is a solidarity, just like if you give a you know, few hundred dollars to your brother or to your sister, you don't get anything over and above. So we uh, have just uh, institutionalized the individual concept of giving a loan to a friend. So this is, uh, as you mentioned, this is Alhamdulillah, the biggest interest fee program in the world. And uh, we have uh, 1 million active borrowers and we have served around 4 million loans. As Kessel was mentioning, the definition of uh, crisis and leadership, you know, I was just wondering that uh, crisis is, in fact, a uh, testing ground for the leadership. So this is the time where uh, uh, you, your true self emerges, uh, how creative you are, how innovative you are, how much you are willing to go out of box. That is the need of a crisis, and that is the response of a leader in a critical situation. So true leadership is measured in crisis. In, you know, when the things are fine, then we don't do anything extraordinary. We're just managing the affairs. We have protocols, we have, you know, uh, uh, manuals and we have instructions and policies. But then suddenly there is a bomb explosion, when suddenly there is a flood, when suddenly there is a fire, 
So here comes the test of the great people that how do they react in an uncertain condition? So that's, I see, you know, this crisis and uh, the response of the nations of the world uh, uh, during this crisis represents their leadership potential, leadership capacity. And I'm, I'm extremely humbled to mention that in Pakistan, the people were talking that there will be huge losses, but uh, with the dignity, with honor, with commitment, with wisdom, with patience, with sacrifice, with the desire to give and share, Alhamdulillah, our response is amongst the one of the best responses in the world. But still, there is a need for hope. There is a need for optimism. And we need to inculcate a spirit of giving and you know, working together. So for that, uh, you are working a lot. And uh, you are this uh, support for organizing this Hopathon and inviting so many brilliant minds and the people with great potential and talent who are leaders in uh, you know uh, international community so we are very keen to listen to their words of advice how do they see this crisis and how do they see hope emerging so that will be a great opportunity for our to learn for our 1 million borrowers families who are actively engaged currently and the 4 million others and of course we run institutions educational institutions where students uh, are you know, getting education free of cost. So here this fee structure is that first get education and pay after 10 years. We don't take fee in advance. We invest in the you know, young minds and expect that they will be able to pay after 10 years, 15 years. And with that fee, somebody else will be studying in these institutions. So all those are you know, waiting for your pieces of advice. Thank you very much. And I won't take much of your time. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Saqib. Uh, yes, uh, the book actually, Kansa mentioned, Made in Crisis, that would be out in September. Uh, one of our thesis, we both of the co-authors, is that we all are ordinary people until a crisis finds us. It doesn't mean that we should be actively searching for a crisis, but that's how the life is. And how we survive and thrive in the crisis uh, that is that is the stuff the leaders are actually made of. Uh, this particular crisis, the pandemic, has affected the whole world, billions of people, um, the whole econo like economic order of the world. Actually, it has no style, and we are still struggling uh, to save lives and at the same time get back on track. This is something that will keep on running in the background because uh, uh, the excellencies and ambassadors. Um, the honorable uh, guests for today, they are going to share their experience, how their particular country and uh, has been fighting in this uh, global crisis uh, against the coronavirus. And at the same time, how, how they feel, how Pakistan has been doing um, so well uh, that uh, recently the cases have been plummeting. That's one of the good news as we celebrate this in day of independence. We understand that Pakistan is recovering very well from this pandemic. Our first, um, of, to start this program formally, uh, we're actually inviting our first honorable guest. Um, I'll be introducing uh, Farhat and myself will be conducting this uh, program. And then after three or four guests, we'll be having a panel discussion, summing up everything, what our honorable friends are going to share. Uh, so on this 74th day of independence, we initiate this program with uh, our uh, ambassador, uh, from the United States. Well, Alif say America, uh, uh, that, is, that becomes the starting point. So uh, I'll be quickly introducing uh, pro the, this long profile, but a short profile of Ambassador Paul W. Jones, uh, who is present with us. Ambassador Jones um, became U.S. charge the affairs uh, to Pakistan in September 2018, so almost two years. So hopefully we'll uh, we'll hear some uh, uh, one or two sentences in Urdu from Ambassador Jones. Um, he has been a U.S. ambassador to Malaysia and Poland uh, before coming to Pakistan. He has wide-ranging experience in South and South Asia. In Washington, D.C., he served concurrently as Deputy U.S. Special Representative for Afghanistan and Pakistan and Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for South Asian Affairs. So, Ambassador Jones, 
understands uh, this whole region pretty well. So Ambassador Jones will be uh, will be expecting uh, your your opening remarks on uh, uh, for actually uh, Pakistan uh, for people of Pakistan. There are thousands who are watching this program live um, on this 74th day of independence. And at the same time, uh, before uh, before you start, we have our best wishes and prayers for our American friends um, to recover very well from the ongoing coronavirus pandemic. Assalamu alaikum and boho shukriya. Uh, thank you so much for that kind introduction and, and for this opportunity. Um, I'm just gonna pause for a moment and see if you give me a thumbs up that you can hear me well. Okay, great, um, terrific. Uh, to talk about um, our cooperation between our countries uh, amidst this terrible pandemic. And I just wanna say at the outset how striking it is, and I've heard the story before, but to hear it um, <clears throat> firsthand and the show you put on about the wonderful work that that you all have been doing with microfinance and, and in providing hope to a lot of people. Um, it's, it's really very moving. Um, you know, and I thank you also for mentioning uh, the, uh, the loss of life and the struggles that we have had in the United States. Um, all countries around the world have been affected by this terrible pandemic and we have to work all urgently together to prevent its spread. And we're all adapting to new ways of interacting and I appreciate this opportunity to do this uh, virtually. Um, and I think the story of the United States-Pakistan cooperation is one that's not very well known and it has deep roots, um, but it has intensified quite uh, significantly since this pandemic started. Um, and so we're working both on the, on the economic and the health fronts um, more intensively, I think, in those areas than we have certainly in a long, long time. Um, and our basic premise is you know the United States government, the, United, the American people want Pakistan, as well as all countries of the world, but here we are in Pakistan to succeed against this coronavirus and to minimize the economic, economic impacts. The cooperation between our countries is supported explicitly at the top levels. There's been several conversations between President Trump and Prime Minister Khan, and um, we see that what's good for Pakistan uh, is good for the United States and, and vice versa. Um, we're all connected and our mutual prosperity depends on each other. So the sooner we can recover and, and really get back our focus to expanding our trade and investment uh, relationship, uh, we see is the better for, for our peoples. Um, we also want our political relationship to emerge stronger based on this cooperation. You know, we back in around the time I got here in September of 2018, we embarked on a on a project uh, together and with many other countries, but to support a, a peace agreement in Afghanistan and end the war there. And then we added, especially at the time about a year ago of, of Prime Minister Khan's visit to the White House, a real focus on our commercial and economic ties to, to lift up our, our peoples and our economies. And those I think have been good pillars. And I think now we've got a very firm pillar of foundation working together on the health front. And so I wanted to just talk about that for a few moments um, here today. It's um, not very well known how deep and long standing our US-Pakistan health partnership has been. The original cooperation uh, began back with the US uh, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, uh, also known as CDC, back in the late 1980s. And it, and it stepped up considerably in the early 2000s um, with uh, a lot of support and collaboration uh, with the Ministry of Health uh, against influenza. And, and this expanded also to a Ministry of Health, National Institute of Health joint program for field epidemiology and lab training that graduated over 550 field epidemiologists here in Pakistan over the last five years. And, and we have worked together uh, in those training programs on preparedness to detect and respond to outbreaks. And, and we feel, feel that that human capital and that way of working together has, has been, I think, a benefit here in Pakistan and in, in throughout the country. Um, one example of, of another area we've worked in more recently, um, we worked with the National Institute of Health to establish in 2018, so before the pandemic, an emergency operations center and including rapid response teams for, for influenza outbreaks. And we supported expansion of that lab capacity, both in the NIH lab and in Quetta and Peshawar more recently. Um, and we're currently uh, cooperating to build lab capacity in, in Lahore 
and we're looking at discussing new sites with leadership in other provinces as well. Now, specifically in response to this COVID outbreak, um, an additional 2,400 district and provincial, provincial field staff were trained on infection detection and outbreak response and over 800 healthcare and lab personnel were also provided COVID training as part of this joint training program that we've been embarked on a long time and we've redirected it together toward uh, the COVID outbreak. Um, USAID has also been very active recently in, for some years in, in public health, complementing the CDC efforts. So, and recently here at our embassy, we've added uh, CDC public health experts as well as our public health experts at USAID to strengthen our cooperation analysis uh, with our Pakistani counterparts. More broadly, the United States has long been a, a leader in public health assistance and, and continues that tradition with more than $1.2 billion committed so far in countries across the globe to fight this pandemic. And Pakistan, very early on, we designated as a priority country. Uh, so this longstanding health partnership has enabled us to move very quickly uh, to fill critical needs and expand existing joint work. So within 48 hours of a request early on from the federal uh, health ministry in February, USAID collaborated to fund and build a website, which is now used by the National Disaster Management Authority and donors for procurement and inventory of personal protective equipment. Overall, we've designated $30 million in new funding for mobile labs to test, uh, provide testing in, in, in hotspots. Um, and those are being deployed sort of as we speak, they're just not coming online. Uh, expanded healthcare worker training that I discussed, upgrades to provincial emergency operation centers that I mentioned, and, and um, critically important uh, ventilators, which uh, I was just very recently um, pleased to participate in with General Afsal, uh, uh, the head of NDMA, in the transfer of a second tranche of a total of 200 state-of-the-art American ventilators, a donation of the American people, complete with training for hundreds of Pakistani healthcare workers, and they're being distributed, they actually are being distributed and have been, most of them are already distributed, very rapidly in healthcare facilities and hospitals throughout the country and giving a capacity at local levels that really didn't previously exist with the, with the training. These, these particular ventilators are not only for the most extreme uh, cases of intubation, but are, are very helpful with oxygen therapy. So in early stages, it can help, they can help a lot of uh, patients. Um, and we've also supported the Pakistani private sector to produce COVID-19 treatments and have assisted Afghan refugees and host communities. So in addition, um, in addition to those COVID special uh, uh, designated programs, we've recently provided funding that we think is very helpful in programs that complement that, including $6 million for humanitarian assistance, including therapeutic food for children with acute malnutrition and medical equipment to, to help treat that malnutrition. And just in all everything we do and um, you know, whether it's through our assistance programs or our education exchanges, we're scrubbing all our partnership programs to find other ways to sort of redirect our efforts and make them relevant to the current, the current crisis. So for example, our English language teaching programs are now delivered on radio and our English language after school access program, a wonderful program that, that allows students to volunteer after school to become more proficient in English, that's normally in cat classrooms are, are now online and, and they're doing very well online. Um, they're both, and what we do also is we incorporate coronavirus messages, the, the same SOPs that the government puts out on, on social distancing, staying at home if you're ill, hygiene, wearing face masks, and particularly support and respect for healthcare workers. Um, there have been a few creative efforts that I wanted to share um, with, that USAID has embarked on recently to strengthen small enterprises during this challenging time. And one is in collaboration with Food Panda. We organized a series of online business management and marketing training sessions for women-led and home-based food businesses. So the training was custom designed in response to COVID-19, making it relevant to these challenging times and lifting the morale and uh, the participation of, of female entrepreneurs uh, running these small companies. We're also working uh, through USAID with the government of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa to provide 
technology necessary to operate virtually and, and maintain social distancing. So we recently provided licensing for the Zoom meeting platform, as well as equipment software for, for more telemeetings. And we're at now working actively with Pakistani authorities on, on additional ways to meet uh, urgent needs. Um, more broadly, on the economic front, uh, the United States uh, is a, was the leading supporter of the international uh, uh, in international financial fora uh, of the G20 Debt Services Suspension Initiative and supporting the IMF's $1.4 billion rapid financing instrument for Pakistan. So overall, we're, we're, as I say, quickly expanding our health partnerships. We're redirecting our education partnerships. We're cooperating in new ways on economic partnerships to try to contribute to the holistic challenge that, uh, that, that we face together. And it's far more than a governmental effort. So US businesses who are invested here in Pakistan are also contributing. Accelerate Energy, which, is, uh, which helps bring in uh, LNG uh, here in Pakistan, made a substantial contribution to the Karachi Relief Trust for food rations for 25,000 low income peoples for a month. Pepsi, Coke, McDonald's, Hardee's, KFC have all been contributing meals for healthcare workers and law enforcement and those impacted directly by COVID-19. Uh, Uber is, uh, provide, has been providing uh, free rides to healthcare workers and delivering meals. Google provided over $5 million in advertising grants and, and credits to support governmental institutions, health organizations, small businesses, so they can disseminate information on how to stop the spread of COVID-19. And, and this helps small businesses to continue reaching to, out to their customers despite the need for, for distancing. And in addition, in addition Glo uh, Google has launched a suite of free online tools and training, including for remote workers, teachers, and, and business owners. And US medical companies who are invested here are also making significant humanitarian and social responsibility contributions while they look for ways to increase production for local consumption and also for Pakistan to, to be able to export more to the world. Um, so Pakistan has dramatically increased its production of personal protective equipment and, and some relevant pharmaceutical production that, that uh, now that local needs are largely met in that area can help Pakistan become more integrated into the global um, uh, health care um, supply chain. And the United States is working with Gilead Sciences and its local af affiliate, Ferozans, to produce remdesivir locally, which is a treatment for, uh, that is proven um, uh, effective in, in helping treat uh, some cases of, of coronavirus. And, um, and as I say, we're, we're, we're looking for every way we can support Pakistan becoming more integrated into, local, into the global medical supply chains. And finally, I'd notice our, I'd note our, our people to people ties are also contributing. Thousands of Pakistani American doctors and health workers are on the front, front lines back in the United States. The Association of Physicians of Pakistani Descent of North America, APNA, donated uh, about $100,000 to Pakistan for food rations and $20,000 in personal protective equipment. And in the United States, APNA has distributed $62,000 worth of food across the country and do donated personal protective equipment uh, to hospitals in New York. And it's really heartening to see the many Pakistani alumni of our education and exchange programs who have been so active in their communities working uh, to help with this fight against COVID-19. They've been recognized by Secretary Pompeo and, and all of us at the US mission for their critical contrib contributions here uh, from food ration and fa face mask distribution to raising awareness of social distancing and hygiene. So just to conclude, our, I, I think our cooperation really has never been more relevant, more important to the peoples of our countries. Um, I really think it's a foundation for us to uh, have a, a closer, more productive relationship going forward. Um, I really look forward to hearing uh, the, the comments of, of the other participants and I really appreciate this opportunity to share these thoughts with you. A very happy, happy Independence Day to, to all Pakistanis, thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Jones. And yes, a phenomenal strands of relationship in the last 73 years, uh, right from the uh, first day of independence. Um, and yes, you rightly mentioned 
uh, United States uh, support in education, in health, and in social sectors. Um, you also mentioned the access to English program. And as you just mentioned, I would uh, like to recount that I launched this uh, first program with Ambassador Ramsey Crocker in Multan, in fact, in 2006. Um, that was one of, uh, one of the uh, first programs for access to English language. And definitely I'm aware that thousands of students, they, they benefited from this one. Um, you also uh, mentioned the Pakistani uh, doctors and surgeons at Navi work very closely with them as well. And they're having um, such amazing, inspiring stories of Pakistani doctors and health professionals working in the United States, going above the call of the duty to serve their uh, respective country uh, and their fellow countrymen in the United States. Um, while we have some one or two questions, uh, one bit informal question to start with is that, uh, do you enjoy the local cuisine in fact? And what's your favorite in Pakistan? <laughs> Um, I, I have tasted uh, everything I've, I've been offered everywhere. Um, I like, I, I like, you know, I, I just generally like the Pakistani cuisine. Um, I, I'm trying to think, what is my favorite? Um, I, you know, early on, I was easier. I mean, frankly, right now, my favorite is mangoes. I know it's not cuisine, but I can't get enough of mangoes here and there. You know, I've, I've been, I, I, I was three years in the Philippines where they're very proud of their mangoes, especially from an island called Gimaras. And I, I was convinced at that time the best mangoes come from there, but no, it's not true. The best mangoes come from here. Um, but I, in general, like like all all Pakistani cuisine that I've tried. Right. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Jones. Um, I'll be actually introduce. Um, I'll be asking a question, something relevant that you um, initiated uh, your conversation. Like this COVID nineteen pandemic has impacted lives and institutions across the world. And our lives are shifting towards a new unknown to, to a good extent. In the wake of the pandemic, most institutions of the higher education, they have moved towards online education and transitioned to a virtual environment. It's a huge challenge for Pakistani universities as we're used to more traditional lecture-based approaches to teaching. Uh, we actually hosted the last program with around 25 vice chancellors of uh, the institutions of the higher learning in Pakistan. So this, this concern came up there. So a lot of faculty and training, faculty training and technology that's required to ensure smooth transition. In what ways can the US embassy support the institutions of higher learning um, in Pakistan in these testing times? Yeah, sure. Well, you know, as I mentioned, we're looking at every program we do in our education um, uh, programs is um, a, a really ripe field for cooperation. So just Last month, we hosted three virtual sessions with the Higher Education Commission and universities across Pakistan in which a, a professor from the University of Virginia um, shared her expertise in how to assess student performance, one of the great challenges in online learning. And um, USAID is developing a program uh, right now called the Higher Education System Strengthening Activity in which American universities will collaborate with higher education commission with the higher education commission and 15 universities across pakistan to to strengthen different aspects of the higher education system and and one thing we're doing right now is looking at how we can uh, particularly direct that to online learning because i think frankly we hope to get past online learning but but i think there uh, we are also learning that there's some benefits to online learning in some ways that maybe we can incorporate it more into our education um, at all levels, uh, even when times are okay. And so, so we're looking again at that in different ways where we can redirect, you know, incorporate into all our programs, um, sharing expertise and experience in, in online learning. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Thank you so much, Ara, for the introductions. And I'm, I'm so honored to um, share the panel with you and, uh, and, and Dr. Saqib. Of course, uh, welcoming all, uh, all uh, you know, distinguished panelists, and of course, ambassadors. Thank you, Ambassador. You have, um, you have I mean, I'm, I'm truly aware that the U.S. Embassy has always been a great supporter of women empowerment, especially the economic empowerment of women, right? So, 
over the time period, I have also witnessed a lot of programs that um, U.S. Embassy or um, U.S. government do is is ensuring the gender equality. Of course, this is excellent. I'm I mean, since being a woman leader and of course promoting the woman empowerment always gives me a warm feeling when I see that and that happening there in the U.S. Embassy, of course, in the U.S. government. Um, I am from the higher education institution and of course from the sector. I also envision my institution as, as one of the leading higher education institution in diplomacy, leadership, and of course, uh, peace studies. So over the time period, um, we have seen that the women leadership and there, there's a lot of difficulties for women to be there at the higher education um, institutions at the highest level of the leadership in the institutions. For instance, we have a very handful of vice chancellors who are there um, leading the universities, of course, like vice chancellors or women leaders there in the uh, in the decision making tables there in the universities, uh, which I always, always promote that the woman should be there in the table of, of decision making. So Ambassador, can you please share if there are any current projects that female leaders in the higher education sector is going on uh, at the embassy or USAID or US government? Please share. Yeah, I'd be delighted. Um, first, I'd just like to say that, uh, you know, it's um, a central part of, of who we are as a, as a US mission and an embassy. And, and we go to great lengths and we, we've spent a lot of time, I've been, uh, played a small role in this myself, but really in our mission, we're always looking for how to make sure our workforce, because we hire many Pakistanis in different uh, capacities at our embassy and our three consulates, how we can make sure that women are, are fully represented at all, at all levels and at all capacities. And one of the things I'm most proud of here, frankly, is when I have, uh, or I used to have, when we were able to do it um, every month, a, a tea with, um, with some of our uh, locally hired employees, our Pakistani employees, um, inevitably, the women would speak up and say how um, how professional and respectful they find the workplace here, which is a, a big focus, um, you know, in in our embassies around the world. And and I'm very proud that you know, none of us are perfect, and but we've made it a place where where clearly women want to work. And in our programs that you. Um, that you referred to. So just earlier this year, um, we had a delegation from the Higher Education Commission, so before the pandemic, and and, um, uh, and several universities um, visited U.S. universities on an exchange program, and, and half the delegates there, as we always strive to ensure, were women. And right now, um, we are in the idea stage of planning an exchange for female university in administrators. So exactly what you're speaking to, particularly female university administrators, to travel to the United States to share experiences with with their counterparts there, and we would do that once things are when once it's safe to travel. Um, but as we look, and I I you know uh, oversee the 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 education exchange programs that we do, we we are always striving to make sure that women, uh, particular you know women from across the country are are well represented, we, we achieve almost half um, of all of those that participated in our various exchange programs are women and we'd love to, to you know, make that even more. We're always looking for great candidates. Yeah, thank you so much, Ambassador. Uh, I think that this is amazing that your work has, you know I mean, contributing and supporting Pakistan. Um, of course, um, the last question might be uh, about the entrepreneurial support that the U.S. Embassy is supporting to uh, the productivity in Pakistan. Uh, your thought on that? Um, so we've, uh, I mean, one another thing that I'm, I'm very pleased with here, early on when I arrived and we had a reception for entrepreneurs and people who support entrepreneurship, I, I remember one person who participated said, you know, it was very popular now in a lot of countries and a lot of people want to support it. He says, we'll always come. He said, all of us here will always come to your events at the U.S. Embassy because you were the first really to be very proactive in supporting small business entrepreneurship and technopreneurship technology. We want to continue to be a leader in that regard. And, and the current crisis, you know, is, is really a challenge for small businesses. So we set up uh, for this reason, USAID launched a special round of, of what's called its Challenge Fund, which offers 8 million rupees to small and medium-sized enterprises 
particularly those that are struggling during this pandemic. Um, and we've also hosted recently a, a series of online training sessions for, again, women-owned businesses on, on expert practices and procedures. And that was, in fact, just publicized uh, yesterday in the media. So um, we're, we're doing, again, what we can to, to, even in this time, to promote entrepreneurs who are struggling um, alive and well. Uh, thank you so much, Ambassador, for, for this quick uh, reply as well. Your message of hope on this Independence Day for the people of Pakistan who might be listening to you, hearing you, and your message of hope on this day. Well, my message of, of hope is that I think that this crisis, we've learned that we need each other now more than ever. And I think if we continue uh, on that line, we will emerge um, stronger and working in ways together that are even more relevant and more, um, uh, you know, and more appreciated and understood by the peoples of our country. So my message of hope is that we all emerge healthy and, and safe and everybody um, takes care of themselves and their family members and their friends and, and, and everyone to emerge safe and healthy, but that we emerge closer and we learn something from this about how much we need each other. Excellent and brilliant. Thank you so much for sharing the message of hope and sharing with us this uh, panel as well and be with us in this special day, which is so much important in our national ethos. Ambassador Paul Jones was with us. Thank you so much for your kind presence. Um, I'm, I'm so honored. I'm so honored as a woman as well and, and seeing an excellent and brilliant women who are serving at the highest positions in the diplomacy. Uh, I'm honored to introduce Ms. Ellison Blackburn who is Acting High Commissioner, British High Commission in Islamabad at the panel. She is here right now. And Miss Allison. Miss Allison was the British Ambassador to the South Sudan from April 2017 to May 2019. And before that, British High Commissioner to Uganda from August 12th to November 26th. 16. And she was all she joined the Foreign Service in 1987 and served at important positions in Warsaw, Stockholm, New York, and of course in the UN. Um, of course, um, in, in serving as Harare and Brazils as well. So, um, and of course, for the short terms in Jakarta, Washington, and Moscow, with such an amazing career, she has also spent two years on in the Ministry of Justice as a principal private secretary to the Justice Secretary uh, in, in, the, in the government. Um, and I'm so honored that Ms. Alison Black uh, Byrne is here and sharing this panel. Um, Arif Anissa. Hi, uh, Your Excellency. Well, we understand that. Uh, we are missing our very dear friend, Dr. Christian uh, Turner, but at the same time, we are equally uh, delightful um, having you here um, uh, with, um, with uh, uh, the High Commissioner, His Excellency Turner. We, we have been exchanging uh, loads in the, in the past uh, couple of weeks. Um, now, as uh, you are uh, here, we must ask you about your message for uh, the people of Pakistan on the 74th Independence Day. Um, definitely, there is long-standing uh, relationship that goes very deep um, when it comes to the health, education, social sector, and several sectors where we have been benefited from this mutual relationship. Uh, however, we let's open with your message uh, to the people of Pakistan on this 74th day of independence. Arif Sab, I, I could not see her. I hope that she's here, but she's, I guess she's out. I could not see her. Oh, right. So in this case, uh, uh, I was confirmed that uh, she is here. So uh, in this case, uh, can we yes. check upon or should we proceed to the next guest? Yeah, we can proceed to the next guest. And next guest, of course, while she will be here. While she will be here. Yes. Uh, is uh, um, Honorable His Excellency uh, Ambassador Paul John is here. I would like to respond to one or two, uh, you know, Please. ideas which he.
Is he, is, is he here and listening? Yes, I'm here, yes, yeah. Yes, yeah, please yeah, go ahead. Nice. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Paul. It was so, uh, you know, uh, freshening listening to you. You were talking about the you know, whole uh, political and social, economic and health uh, collaboration and participation history between the two countries, uh, the United States and uh, yes. Pakistan. And thank you very much for all the support which has been yes. offered to us. I would like to mention that uh, Ahuwal, is a registered entity in the United States. We are a 501c3 uh, just, uh, uh, um, organization in the United States. And uh, during this COVID, you know, we received tremendous uh, support from uh, uh, you know, Hobart USA. The Pakistani Americans contributed a lot of funds. Then we were supported by APNA, as you very, you know, uh, uh, you mentioned their uh, support in other areas as well. So Ahubat also received support from Association of uh, Pakistani Physicians of North America. Then we also received support from SANA. SANA is uh, 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 Sindh Association of North America. And then we got a, a very, you know, uh, sizable uh, donation from Visa Foundation. This is the philanthropic arm of Visa Corporation. So uh, we are extremely grateful that uh, uh, these uh, few organizations supported us. And uh, you mentioned about the educational support, uh, educational relationship and your support for uh, you know, Pakistani students in America. So I'm one of the beneficiaries of Hubert Humphrey Fellowship, the great American statesman. And uh, I was uh, uh, in the United States in Washington DC for two years, uh, um, you know, studying my uh, you know, uh, master's in international development. So. Uh, whatever we have achieved in Akhuvat, you know, it also, you know, we would like to give the credit to the wonderful ideas and the wonderful training uh, we, I received from a, a School of International Studies in American University and uh, by visiting many of the great institutions of your country. So many good ideas, how a nation is built. I, you know, was uh, inspired by the uh, history of the United States. So my, in my humble personal capacity, I'm grateful whatever I learned from uh, United States through Hubert H. Humphrey Fellowship. And uh, then of course, uh, I have a continued relationship with my friends in America and I have been visiting America time and again. And uh, you know, during recent COVID, we are overwhelmed by the support given by the uh, American people uh, from uh, Hubert USA, from APNA, from SANA, and from many other uh, uh, persons. So uh, I would like to mention that Ahuva's case study is being taught in uh, the best institution in the world, the Harvard. They, they, they study in Harvard Kennedy School and in uh, you know, uh, 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 that, that the MBA school as well. So uh, we have a long standing relationship and I'm extremely grateful for all the support. And I would like to meet you sometime and you know, give you a presentation on Ahuva's various programs. We, are uh, you know, running a, a university and uh, besides being the biggest microfinance program, we also work for the transgenders. This will be something very interesting for you. That, that is the most neglected section of our society. And we have identified transgenders above the age of 50 years and we are having solidarity with them. We are supporting them. them. Then we have a clothes bank where we have distributed more than 2.5 million best clothes from our friends to our those people who don't have. So I was seeing you wearing a very nice uh, tie and a good suit. So I would request you sometime that if you have some extra clothes, you can donate those clothes to the uh, you know uh, Hubert Clothes Bank. So thank you very much. I truly appreciate and would like to meet sometime. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Saki. It was great to hear. Um, thank you for your kind words. And I'm, I'm just delighted that uh, the you are part of keeping the ties so close and strong between our countries and particularly in the, in the non-governmental sector and the sectors that, that, that really help human lives. Thank you and look forward to getting together and seeing each other uh, in another forum.
Thank you. Thank you so, so much. Indeed. Yes, thank you so much, Arun Sir. Um, another excellent uh, while um, Miss Ellison Black uh, is having the technical issues, she will be joining. But I'm seeing that Miss Windy Glamour, who is an outstanding um, diplomat, outstanding ambassador in, in Islamabad, is here. Arif Sir, please introduce her. She is again a phenomenal woman working for the excellent country and serving at the highest position in the diplomacy. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Fath. And yes, we hope that um, uh, we have our acting high commissioner to join. Uh, but in the meantime, let's proceed with, yeah. with the yeah. high Please commissioner go ahead. from Canada. So, Wendy Gilmore, um, uh, Her Excellency, uh, she joined the Canadian Foreign Services in 1990 uh, and then served in different countries of the world, including uh, Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe, Botswana, and Angola while uh, representing the Canadian government. Um, she also served as Deputy Director in Eastern Europe and Regional Security and Peacekeeping Division um, in the headquarters. Uh, she has been serving in, in teams in Kandahar, Afghanistan, and Director of uh, Sudan Task Force. She was posted to Colorado Springs as a political advisor to Commander North American Airspace Defense Command, which is called NORAD, in 2008, for two years. Uh, from her return to Ottawa, she joined the Department of Public Safety and Senior Departmental Assistance to the Minister. Um, she has also moved to national, uh, national Defense in 2011 and became the Director General International and Industry Programs in the Material Groups, after which she rejoined the Department of Foreign Affairs, Trade and Development in 2015. Um, she has been serving in Pakistan for a while, so we welcome Her Excellency uh, Gilmore to this Hopathon Ambassador's Congress. Ambassador uh, Will, Wendy, can you hear us? Uh, Ambassador Wendy? Wendy Gilmore, can you hear us? You are here. Yes, it seems uh, she's not yes, here. Was here. Yes, she is yeah. here, um, and uh, the, uh, the mic is muted. Some, yes, it, it might be, might be. Once yes, again. Um, Arif Saab, um, the outstanding contribution from Canada, of course, uh, has remained, you know, part and parcel of Pakistan's relations with these countries, in fact. And, uh, you know, um, an outstanding contribution. My own experience remaining in the different institutions in Canada has remained outstanding. You know, they're supporting a lot of initiatives, a lot of um, uh, works that has been done in Pakistan. And especially when a woman is leading a high commission in Pakistan, you know, this is, this is amazing to see that, that the countries are thriving and sharing the hope and, and togetherness here. So um, I, I see that uh, Excellency Windy, uh, can you can you hear us? Yes, it seems we have some kind of Zoom turbulence today. Um, I actually noticed, uh, and well, we can check on them whether. Oh. Yeah, we have to check. Here. Yeah, actually, she is here. I can, I can see yeah, can the see participants. That. But yes, um, but uh, seems that with some reason. She's unable to listen to this call. Yeah, so uh, I hope we can request our support group to quickly get in touch with, uh, with the Canadian Embassy, uh, just to make sure that uh, she's able to join us, because I think it'd be good to get it on the track. Um, yes, and exactly. We probably have uh, the Acting High Commissioner uh, from the UK Embassy as well. But let's uh, get this sorted. So, yeah, we'll be pausing for a few seconds. In the meantime, we'll be quickly tracing the High Commissioner and getting back shortly. Apologies for the pause. We also welcome um, the High Commissioner um, from Sri Lanka, His Excellency Vice Admiral yeah. Mohan. Rajiv Vikram, um, who will be actually speaking at his turn, um, but yeah, we, actually, we, warmly, his yeah, we, we warmly welcome him to join us as well. Uh, 
Okay, I, uh, yes. Uh, so we got uh, Our Excellency uh, Ms. Wendy Gilmore oh, yes, back. Oh, yes, there you are. Oh, so, Thank you so, so much. Right, so, <laughs> yes, it's, uh, yeah, so welcome I mean, back. And, uh, it's uh, we technology, quickly... you know, we can't do anything about that, you know. <laughs> yes. Can you welcome hear us and... properly? Can you hear us properly? Yes, you can hear us. Oh, I'll be quickly uh, starting because you have been introduced and actually you can open with your message uh, from the Canadian government to uh, the people of Pakistan on the 74th day of independence, Your Excellency. That's wonderful. First of all, can, can everybody hear me? Am I yes. audible? Wonderful. Yeah. So thank you, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation to join you this afternoon. I think, uh, I think this is a, a great initiative and uh, a wonderful celebration for the, the 14th of August, Pakistan's Independence Day. Um, my, my message for Pakistanis is a congratulations from the people of Canada for your Independence Day. The, uh, it's a particularly challenging year for so many people and a challenging time. And it's wonderful to have a day to celebrate, particularly at this time when certainly on the COVID front, Pakistan has been uh, demonstrating over the last few weeks, even sort of almost a month, um, the discipline necessary to cut the spread of COVID, to, to implement the SOPs, to abide by the lockdowns, to ensure that they're protecting themselves, their families, their communities, and, and uh, trying to slow the spread. And that's been um, to the effect that now the, uh, the government has opened up Pakistan, much as is happening in Canada, to, uh, to a lot more commerce and, uh, and effort. So I, my, my broad message is congratulations to the people of, of Pakistan and really uh, let's, let's keep at it. Um, follow the SOPs on a Zoom call. I don't have to put my face mask on, but uh, um, let's keep the social distance. Let's follow the SOP. Let's, let's follow the advice of local authorities, our health experts who are really on the front lines. They're the ones that wear the cost of this disease, in fact, almost more than anyone. So it, it really is all of our responsibility to do what we can to help. But, uh, but what's been happening so far has been very positive. Um, the Canadian government, uh, um, certainly on the COVID front, has been doing our best to support Pakistan in its efforts. Um, we, we provided funding to the World Health Organization's consolidated fund, its pool so specifically for Pakistan. We have a number of development efforts that are underway that we've been able to retool to focus on some of the more urgent needs, particularly as they impact women and girls. So we have programs in maternal health, in um, um, sexual and reproductive health that help women under normal circumstances. And in this particular environment, we're finding real challenges to access to healthcare, to women accessing the services they need to keep themselves healthy, to keep their children healthy, and so we've been focusing on those efforts. Um, we've been focusing some of our advocacy and engagement efforts to make sure that marginalized communities are able to access the services and support they need, particularly in a time of crisis. We continue to focus on, on education, in particular girls' education, which is so important for Pakistan's development. And, um, and it, it just, uh, it, it's, it's really heartening to see that these efforts, are, I think, are, are starting to bear fruit. So that, that's my general message. It's a pleasure to be here today. I'm very happy to have a conversation. Oh, excellent, when, uh, Ambassador Wendy. This is such a splendid time to be together, especially and seeing women who are leading and up front in the diplomacy and leadership position. It's always heartwarming to introduce uh, such an amazing woman. Thank you so much, Excellency, for sharing the, this message of hope, of course. Uh, my question would be that since, you know, as, as we have also been discussing about, you know, you know disruption of a lot of, uh, you know, um, higher education or education in, in, in overall, uh, we have seen a lot of uh, good, um, you know, good practices there in Canada as well. That how they are managing um, the health, you know, education system, and how they are engaging their uh, teachers and students' conversations. So, what are your, uh, what are the, um, you know, uh, um, you know, Canadian High Commission here in Islamabad is is providing assistance to the students who are aspiring to go to Canada to study, uh, especially joining the higher education institutions and how this education linkages between Pakistan and those in Canadian institutions are building up, especially in these difficult times. Oh, well, thank you very much. So just uh, maybe a few words on what's happening in Canada. 
um, with respect to, uh, to COVID. Um, much, much like Pakistan, although Canada was a little bit earlier on the curve, we saw a significant spike of cases in the March and April time period to the extent that Canada closed its economy. Schools were closed, education, uh, higher instit institutes of higher education, universities and colleges were closed and people were locked down. So at the current moment, while the numbers have come down, um, every jurisdiction in Canada, like Pakistan, Canada is a federal state. We have 10 provinces, each with their own jurisdiction in health and education, as well as other areas. Um, and they are opening in phases, depending on what's actually happening in that particular province, and in fact, within regions in that province. So in, um, in most provinces, Schools would be out during the summer anyway. So the planning is focusing on what's going to happen in September when normally the fall term of school would start. And the, depending on the jurisdiction, it's, it's different in each one. There's a real effort like here in Pakistan to start planning for primary school children to return, understanding the incredible importance to their cognitive development, to um, their educational opportunities to get primary school kids back into, into educational institutions and that primary kids don't seem to have the same spreading potential that older children, secondary students, and university students do. On the university side, which is where we see most of the student exchanges between Canada and Pakistan taking place, most universities are not going to have in-class fall sessions. So for a foreign student to go to Canada they have to be able to demonstrate that the, the institution that they are accredited to, that they're enrolled in, requires their physical presence. And, uh, and that's a conversation that happen, has to happen between the student and their school, and then the documentation provided to the student to demonstrate to the Canadian border official that the point port of entry, that they are indeed allowed to enter Canada. Um, I, I should say, just in case people are not aware, for, as a result of Canadian community, Canada has restricted all discretionary travel. So if you hold a visitor visa to go to Canada, it is not um, valid right at the moment. The only people allowed to travel to Canada are permanent residents, Canadian citizens, and the immediate family member of those permanent residents or Canadian citizens. So dependent children, parents, and spouses. That's it. Um, no one else is allowed to enter Canada at the moment. And there are certain exceptions that are also available for essential services. So medical professionals that can get certification to travel and other essential activities where if you're not a citizen or a permanent resident, you can travel. But aside from that, there is no uh, discretionary travel to Canada. So for students, this is very challenging, especially for students that were already accepted into first year programs. Because if you do not have an existing visa that was issued before, I forget the exact date, but I believe it's before something like March the 10th, um, you, we will not, uh, you're, you're not expected to probably need to go to Canada this fall. Um, we have started, we have opened, the Canadian government has opened the visa application centers again so that we're starting to process visas. But even if you hold a visa, it doesn't mean that you're going to be eligible to go to Canada unless you fit one of these categories of essential travel or exceptions. So it's a very challenging situation for students. Um, even for students that are Canadian students, they're having to figure out, do they go to class this fall or not? Um, I can say just on a personal level, my sister and brother-in-law are both university professors in biology, which is a, a lab-based study. They, they study fish, so they physically have to go into the lab and feed their fish and take care of their fish. And they are also only allowed to have very limited numbers of students that are in the labs and most of their class and teaching will be online. So it, it remains a very challenging situation. The, the situation is under review at all times. So for those people, those students in particular that were planning on going to Canada, really encourage you to watch the websites, Immigration, Refugee and Citizenship Canada, ircc.ca and also the websites of the, the High Commission of Canada. If you Google Canadian High Commission Pakistan, it'll take you into a website that will give you the necessary links with the information. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. Arif Sir? Yeah, thank you very much, Your Excellency. Um, all of this is very useful information for the respective Pakistani students and travelers who are planning actually to visit Canada. In Canada also, we have now a very burgeoning 
Pakistani diaspora, and it's good to see Pakistanis, Pakistani Canadians, in fact, even in, in the provincial and uh, um, central assemblies, uh, which is very, very encouraging. Uh, the relationship between both the countries is evolving. It has been evolving in the last couple of decades. Uh, I would like to have your comments, particularly to Pakistan's fight against the COVID-19, um, as, as you are there and you understand that the cases are now decreasing, they are on the declining curve now. Uh, so it was projected that Pakistan might face um, a huge backlash in terms of uh, uh, the pandemic. So how do you see Pakistan's fight? And uh, as we see that we are winning, so uh, what kind of uh, a success story can we pick up from here? It, it's, it's a very, I mean, it, it's absolutely fascinating to, uh, to have been here and to have observed the progress and the course of this disease in Pakistan. And, and, and indeed, as we've been looking around the world, um, you know, I, I, was, I was talking to some colleagues the other night saying, you know, we, we've all become amateur epidemiologists these days. And, uh, and, it, and we have to be very careful to actually not, not think that we are experts. We, we really have to listen to the experts, to the scientific information, to the data collection that's being gathered and being assessed by the people who do this for the living. You know, it, it's the, the rest of us are just interested observers. But from, from an interested observer perspective, what I have found particularly heartening and to some degree um, surprising, and we won't know why, is that the case numbers in Pakistan seem to have been brought under control. No question that it would be great if there was a higher proportion of testing to population in Pakistan than there is currently. Um, there's all sorts of reasons why, why that's the case and everything from uh, access and capacity, but, but the government has, has a demonstrated capacity of, I believe, up to now 45 or 50,000 test, test kits that they could be doing daily. And I think we're seeing between 20 and, and 25,000 tests being done daily. But even within that testing, as the experts have, have explained to me, what is critical is the, the percentage of positive tests within the numbers of tests that are being done. And that number is clearly far down from what it was at the peak of when the numbers were, were coming up, which was sort of in the, the two weeks or so post, uh, post Eid in May. And sort of mid-June was, was really when we the spike of numbers. So it, it's, it's, it's very heartening to see that the policy of test, track, and quarantine that the government has established has been implemented by the health administrations in each of the provinces um, Pakistan's been able to, to make wonderful use of the very extensive polio surveillance network to help collect the data and manage the data. I mean, it is a, it's a terrible shame that polio still exists in Pakistan, but on the, on the good news side of that is that this infrastructure that had a very good sense of surveillance of health systems through the country looking for polio cases was able to be retooled to some degree to look for cases of COVID and to help collect the necessary statistics from educational institutions. Canada has been a very strong supporter of the polio campaign in Pakistan for many years. We continue to be, and, uh, and the rigor and scientific approach that the polio campaign has employed is, it's, it, as I say, it's been very positive that it's been able to be used for, uh, for the support of the polio, uh, the, the COVID crisis. As well, I mean, separately from polio, the the call centers that were set up, the proactive engagement with some cases that were set up was also very positive. I guess my bottom line and, and the, the message that I give my Canadian community, my staff here at the High Commission is don't get complacent. There's, there's an expectation, I think, globally that there will be second waves of infection. And as the economy reopens, there is the danger that that accelerates as tourism starts happening and people start moving to their home villages and regions, as large numbers of people go to tourist destinations, it's really important to maintain those SOPs so that the virus is not reintroduced into areas where it might have been eradicated. And, and that's, you know, that's not a responsibility for authorities, that's an individual responsibility for each one of us to do what we can. I hope to be a tourist in Pakistan fairly soon, and I can tell you I will be traveling with my masks, with my negative COVID test, with my hand sanitizer and, uh, and doing my very best to make sure that I'm not the source of the problem as I move around. But, but I think um, 
why the virus has perhaps not been as virulent here as the statistics would show that it's been elsewhere is an open question. I will look very much forward to the, the experts when they're able to look backwards and try and figure out why this has been the case. Um, demographics, I'm sure, plays, plays a, um, a role. The proportion of people that have died of COVID in Canada has been disproportionately very elderly. That elderly cohort doesn't exist to the same size in places like Pakistan. Um, there may be other factors involved. We just don't know at this point. All we know is what we can do, and what we can do is take the necessary precautions to try and avoid the spread of the disease. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Um, all of this has been uh, hugely, um, like that's a, that's a big uh, endorsement, in fact, uh, for what uh, the government of Pakistan has done. And thankfully, uh, Pakistan seems to be uh, crawling out of uh, uh, the hot spot, which is, which is a wonderful news. Uh, before you go, uh, will we just ask you to just share about your intentions to travel into the country. So uh, when it comes to Pakistan, uh, what is your favorite in terms of food, in terms of culture, and in terms of your places to visit? Be wonderful knowing. It, it's, I always have to be very careful answering this question because uh, you know, I, I don't want to pick favorites in the country at all. And one of the, I mean, I am, I really honestly feel so blessed to be a diplomat, to be here representing Canada. Um, it, it's just, you know, we, we are, we are hired and paid to learn about another country and to get out and explore and to represent, you know, Canada to the world. And, and it's just such a privilege to be here in Pakistan and doing that. Um, you know, the, the downs, one of the, aside from, of course, people getting ill and the terrible tragedy of the people who've died, but the, the curtailment that COVID has, has made on all of our ability, every person in Pakistan, our ability to move about and to engage and to have these social connections, um, that, that's been a challenge for me because I like to get out and about. I like to travel. I want to visit as many places in Pakistan as I possibly can. Um, and uh, and to get to know this beautiful country, um, it's uh, it's it's been you know sort of I, I will be coming up on Lord, almost two years in in early November, and I've managed to visit every province now except for Baluchistan, and I had been supposed to be going to Baluchistan in the end of March, so uh, so I will be looking for an opportunity to do that. Uh, I hope fairly soon, it's yeah. safe indeed to do so. Um, I. Uh, People that know me um, know that I am very much of an outdoor person. I, I uh, since I was very young, always been um, a climber and a hiker uh, with more or less skill and a lot of enthusiasm, probably less on the skill side. So I, uh, I have, have really enjoyed being a tourist as well as, as doing official work in the Northern regions, in the, the hill regions, but I'm also, and I can to, uh, to get to the areas down south that I haven't been to. I've been to the cities, but I haven't yet been to, uh, to the desert areas and some of the rural areas. So, so I, I really want a chance to do that. Um, I, will, uh, I will be looking for an opportunity. You know, I'm, I'm always searching for mountains to climb. So I, I hope to be able to get to do that when it's safe to do so later in the summer, or early fall. And, uh, and I'll be sure to, to post some pictures and, and, uh, and let people know um, when when I've uh, when I've returned and and hopefully have have, uh, have succeeded in at least climbing a small small hill or two up uh, up in the north if I can. Thank you so much. This is brilliant, uh, Excellency, for your presence, for your uh, message, for your you know input that the uh, um, Canadian High Commission is supporting Pakistan uh, people of Pakistan in their endeavors either for education, for empowerment, especially women, children, um, and various other um, important uh, segment of the society. And your contribution in leading such an important uh, uh, mission in Pakistan is also commendable. Um, your message of hope in this. Uh, today uh, while you leave or you stay with us. Uh, your message of hope on this day, uh, uh, Master Wendy. Oh, my message of hope, of course, is, is I think like all of us, we are very much hopeful that progress, which is possible for Pakistan continues, that the COVID crisis does not interrupt some of the, the important areas for growth and development for women and girls in particular, one of the, the 
most impactful things that Pakistan could do for its own development is ensure equal opportunity and access for women and girls. Women need to take their place fully in the economy, in the leadership positions, in decision making. I think the World Bank uh, had released a study last year that said that there could be, and I might be getting the figures wrong, but upward of a 30% growth in GDP if women were fully participatory in, in the workplace and in commerce. So you know, my message of hope is that don't let COVID derail this important work. Use the opportunity presented by the crisis to look at how we can leverage new tools like digital, um, how we can leverage the cohesion that we've seen growing in um, the, the working between provincial health ministries with the federal government here in Pakistan. How does that get leveraged to try and expand that cooperation to other areas? How can we use the coherence and commonality of purpose in combating the disease to then look to other health issues that Pakistan is facing? Stunting, endemic disease, access to clean water and sanitation. All of these things are integral to Pakistan's development. Canada has been very pleased as a development partner to work with Pakistan over decades on some of these issues. We will continue to try and do so. And I, I, for one, am really hopeful in Pakistan's future. I would love to see Pakistan grow and develop and address some of these systemic developmental challenges that it has, which will have a huge impact for the whole country. And Canada will be here to, to help and to partner in this effort. Brilliant, Excellency. Thank you so much for your kind presence and such a wonderful message of hope. Uh, I think that this, this message is of hope will, will is giving a me a kind of a dangerous level of HB right now because uh, uh, you know it's, it's such a heartwarming. Um, we are so fortunate enough that we have been joined by um, our very dear friend, uh, Excellency Mr. Yao Jing, Ambassador of People's Republic of China to Pakistan. Arif Saab, you're muted. Yes. You're muted, Arif Sab, you're muted. Excitement gives you mutation sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so I hope uh, I'm good now. All right. So uh, very warmly welcoming our, uh, His Excellency Yao Jian from, from the People's Republic of China. Uh, he's currently serving as Chinese ambassador to Pakistan and she has been Chinese ambassador to Afghanistan between 2015 and 2017. Born in April 1969, Ambassador Yao entered the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in 1991. He has, uh, he has held various posts in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs until he was appointed Chinese Ambassador to Afghanistan in October 2015. In 2017, President of Afghanistan, Ashraf Ghani, bestowed its Sayyid Lezamaruddin Afghani medal upon him for his efforts to promote China-Afghanistan bilateral relationship. In 2017, he was appointed and approved by the 12th Standing Committee of the National People's Congress as the Chinese ambassador to Pakistan, uh, replacing the previous uh, um, ambassador. Um, ambassador Yao actually represents um, the People's Republic of China and uh, Pakistanis hearts and the hearts of our Chinese friends, they are so melted the same, there's so much, so many strands of connections uh, that the relationship between the two countries is considered um, an iron relationship and both are considered iron brothers. So we are ve we're very warmly welcoming here His Excellency, um, the ambassador of the Chinese Republic. And the, while we're opening, I'll be requesting His Excellency to share the official message on this 74th Independence Day. Okay, first of all, I I'm very thankful for you to invite me and uh, give me this opportunity. Let me join my colleagues to present our best wishes to our Pakistani nation. I think that uh, this day, today, it is very special for the whole nation of, uh, of Pakistan. As a neighbor, as a partner, as a friend of Pakistan, China sincerely presents its uh, best wishes for, for Pakistan. For the past uh, almost uh, 73 years, I think that 
with the efforts of the whole Pakistani people, I think that Pakistan has established its own respectful position in the international community. It contributes positively to the regional peace and stability, as well as to the global development and prosperity. The Pakistani nation has been a responsible member of the international community in holding justice, in promoting that the peace and the stability of the world. So on this special day, I think that I also would like to express our respect and also our appreciation for Pakistan's role in the global affairs as well as for the regional peace and stability. Thank you so much for this outstanding. Can yes, please. <laughs> Good. Thank you so much, Ambassador, for sharing such an important message. And of course, uh, it's ironclad, it's higher than Hamalas, it's deeper than the sea, it's sweeter than the honey. And I mean, this is such an important occasion. Uh, and our hope, message of hope, and this Hopathon Congress would not have been you know, complete without your presence, especially when we are sharing a lot of commonalities, a lot of hope uh, in the shape of China, Pakistan, economic corridor, and our you know, seven decades of, I mean, more than, you know, six decades of relationship between uh, Pakistan and China. So Excellency, my question uh, would be especially related to China-Pakistan economic corridor as we are entering into the second phase where socioeconomic development is the hallmark of the second phase uh, apart from agriculture and industrial. So your, uh, you know, I would really like to ask, request you for sharing that those projects that are ongoing, especially related to the socioeconomic development, because those are bringing more closeness, more togetherness amongst our people together. Okay, uh, definitely. I think uh, for our relationship between China and Pakistan, it is a long term. It is uh, an ever progressive relationship. As far as the CPAC is concerned, it's just, I think, the latest project or the latest platform for China and Pakistan work together for, uh, for what we call the common prosperity. Basically, it's for the infrastructure and the economic development. And so for the past uh, six or seven years, that uh, both the governments have uh, devoted or uh, dedicated themselves that for the development of the CPAC projects. CPAC, the first stage, if we put focus on the uh, infrastructure development for right now with the guidance and the vision of the uh, Prime Minister Imran Khan that uh, we have after consultation with the Pakistani government we have to more focus and the resources in the industrialization, agriculture, and the social sector cooperation. I think this is natural that, uh, because uh, the people's uh, well-being and the prosperity figures high in our bilateral relationship. So as far as this uh, second stage, we call the new stage of the CPAC is concerned, right now, I, I think uh, several, for example, several new mechanisms have been established. We established a new joint working group on agriculture, a new joint working group on science and technology. And uh, this is, I think, uh, basically, uh, we want to uh, channel more resources in these two areas of cooperation. Regarding the industrialization, right now, we are working together with your government is, uh, 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 for the special economic zones. So the Rashkai SEZ is going to be opened very soon. But this kind of SEZ basically is, a lay a, uh, is a, to lay the foundation that for the private to private cooperation. I believe that the private sector in Pakistan is very vibrant and uh, they have a, a lot of experience and they contribute a lot for the development of Pakistan's economy. By joining them through this different capital or technology or equipment or I think experience, I think that even the Chinese private sectors could benefit from their experience and their achievements. 
So the industrialization, we are, we are putting our focus on the private to private cooperation. And uh, there is also a business forum to be established. That is, we will uh, help to establish uh, I think, uh, business to business partnership with the private sectors. As far as the social sector is concerned, I think uh, uh, that is uh, basically, we are going to provide some grants or some uh, resources for the development of the communities, of the sectors, for example, poverty elevation. And uh, this is also a very uh, important area for, for the older developing countries. And uh, this is, uh, of course, uh, is the area that we will put more efforts and resources to, to develop, to develop. And uh, meanwhile, and meanwhile, I think that uh, we are giving uh, quite, we, we are giving a, quite a lot of efforts for the uh, health sector because uh, the latest uh, challenge, COVID-19 virus, it's a challenge to the global world, global community, and also uh, to Pakistan and China. What uh, I'm witnessing is that through your efforts and the resilience, I think uh, I'm very happy that uh, the, this kind of virus has been more or less controlled, controlled in Pakistan. My appreciation is always here that uh, uh, I think that you are able enough uh, in dealing with uh, this kind of challenge in relatively short period of time. So the health sector becomes uh, also uh, part of our social cooperation under the CPAC. When this COVID-19 virus is more or less controlled, I think that uh, the economic revival is uh, very much key for the future development of all the, uh, all the nations, include, including Pakistan. So the CPAC would like to also play a role that uh, for the more economic uh, activities in Pakistan. So we are also following that the Pakistani government's vision, for example, we give more attention to the construction sector. We give more uh, attention that to the mobilization of the employment jobs. And also we give uh, more uh, resources for the skill development se uh, sectors and this. By this effort, I mean, China would like to join Pakistan in developing its own agenda in moving forward with its own vision, also that trying to uh, facilitate and support uh, Pakistan, as well as other countries that in dealing with this uh, uh, very severe challenge of this COVID-19. So the CPAC on the, in the second stage, I think it will become more, I should say more expanded. It will cover a lot of uh, areas it will definitely still have uh, some kind of, has some kind of uh, infrastructure projects like the mainline railway, some high hydropower stations, but also more resources and more efforts will be given to the private sectors, to the technology and to the agricultural sector. So this is I, my understanding of the CPAC. But China and Pakistan, our cooperation is not limited only on the CPAC, we have other areas of cooperation. But CPAC is the major part of our bilateral uh, economic cooperation. Ma'am? Thank you so much, Excellency, for outlining such an important uh, you know, uh, initiatives that uh, China has been doing in Pakistan. Uh, Dr. Sakib sir? Yes, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to answer, to, you know, ask some questions. Uh, His Excellency, uh, Yao Ring, extremely, you know, honored to listen to you and uh, talk about uh, uh, Pakistan-China relationship. We you, you truly, you know, uh, appreciate your all uh, overwhelming support to Pakistani people in economic prosperity and achieving poverty alleviation in military cooperation and other social development uh, you know, areas. Thank you very much. Yes, I totally agree with you that uh, uh, Pakistani-Chinese relationship is not confined to CPEC only. CPEC just represents a one major initiative, but prior to CPEC, there was a you know, tremendous 
support and tremendous cooperation. So CPEC is mostly, you know, focusing on uh, economic development. So we would like to seek your support uh, in education as well, because we need your wisdom. We want to benefit from your experience. You know, uh, our holy prophet, peace be upon him, you know, uh, uh, said, remarked, uh, observed 1400 years ago, and he encouraged the Muslims to reach up to China to seek wisdom. So going to China to seek wisdom, you know, is an age old uh, uh, desire for us. And uh, we will be very, uh, you know, grateful to you if you can talk on uh, uh, some relationship with reference to education. For that, number one, I would like to request your excellency to visit uh, to, you know, our university in Lahore, whenever you visit to Lahore next time, because this is a national university and we have student uh, college, uh, we have students from all provinces of Pakistan. You will see students from Gawadar, you will see students from Gilgit, Baltistan, you will see students from, uh, you know, uh, Peshawar and uh, Karachi and uh, 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 different cities of Punjab. So we would like to have you there and talk to our students, give them a piece of advice, how they can become more entrepreneurial and how they can achieve all those great things which have been achieved by your great nation. And then we can also talk on uh, some, uh, uh, you know, uh, exchange of students, our students going to uh, your universities and some of your students might come to, uh, you know, stay here in Pakistan with us and have a, a close interface with our students. So that is another area where I would like to see uh, your comments and your, uh, you know, uh, assistance and support. And uh, uh, of course, uh, my invitation is there and we will be greatly honored and privileged to have you as among our students. And uh, thank you very much again, uh, your, uh, uh, His Excellency Yaw. And uh, uh, what is your response on that? Okay. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Ski, and uh, I'm very happy that uh, you mentioned the cooperation in the education sector. Definitely, I would be more honored uh, to visit your university when I uh, have the chance to visit Lahore again. I think Lahore is the most historical city in Pakistan. It is also a traditional, I should say, the destination of Chinese tourists uh, for its uh, very rich uh, heritage in the cultural and historical sector. As far as the education is concerned, sir, in fact, this is a mutual learning process. You know that uh, 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 under the CPEG, we also that uh, put uh, the education as a part of social uh, sector cooperation. So right now, I think uh, Pakistan is the, uh, is the number three, I think, uh, largest country who have the students in China. Uh, right now, in the, uh, the university students are from Pakistan in China account to uh, is amount to about twenty seven thousand or uh, twenty seven thousand, and uh, under the CPEP we are providing about uh, uh, twenty thousand uh, scholarships. Scholarships. Uh, this is just a part of that, and also we would like to have more. This we call the internship or fellowship cooperation. That's short term. Uh, uh, mutual um, uh, you know, exchange of the visits or exchange of the experiences. So that under the CPEG, we also start the, our, we call the uh, uh, training programs. Every year we have around 300 uh, training programs. We would like to uh, invite about uh, uh, 1,500 Pakistani youth or young students to go to China for a kind of a different uh, uh, training or experiencing or other uh, internship in China. Uh, but also in the meanwhile, Pakistan is a, is a destination for Chinese students. As far as uh, I know, around 1,000 uh, uh, Chinese students are studying in different universities in Pakistan. There are some in Lahore, there are mostly in Islamabad, and also there are some in Karachi. Um, I think that this education is very important because uh, they give uh, more opportunities or more choices for the young population of Pakistan as well as to the young population of, uh, of China. And uh, definitely I would like to uh, encourage more exchange programs among the youth and among the 
uh, university or even high school students. Right now, because of this uh, COVID-19, even I myself is a little limited. For example, according to our own SOPs, right now I'm discouraged to travel to other cities. So my, uh, my uh, activities are more or less limited in Islamabad. But definitely I want to find time to visit Lahore again. I think I have, have visited Lahore for countless times. But every time I can find something new, something more interesting in, in the Lahore. And even now, for example, with the, uh, we have a vocational training uh, center in collaboration with the Punjab University. Our, uh, our teachers, our, uh, our team, they are working in, in Lahore. But uh, fortunately that right now we have a new council general in, in Lahore. I could also ask him that to have some kind of uh, uh, first-hand interaction with Yusuf and uh, let, uh, uh, elaborate, uh, let us elaborate some kind of future opportunities and chances. Definitely, China will do more for the uh, encouragement of uh, education sector. So. Excellent. Thank you so much, Excellency, for your kind presence, for sharing the hope, for togetherness, especially in these troubling times, of course, and this special day on National Day of Pakistan and your insight and support to Pakistani people has always remained, you know, tremendous. Your message of hope while you leave, um, as you have to go early, your message of hope specifically on 74th Independence Day of Pakistan is yeah, all yours, my, Excellency. My my message for the for on this uh, independence day of pakistan i think is very simple we have full confidence for the future of pakistan and based on the past 73 years success of uh, pakistan that i believe pakistan will enjoy peace and prosperity in the long future and also pakistan will be always a positive uh, force for the regional and international peace and prosperity. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Excellency, for your kind presence, uh, for being here. What? Yep. Yes. Uh, Alison is here. Message. Alison, thank you so much, Alison. Uh, Arif Saab, Alison is here. Yes, um, oh, we, we got confirmation that we've got uh, uh, that in High Commissioner um, from, from oh. the United Kingdom. Uh, so thank you, Your Excellency. And we are actually going to introduce um, um, Her Excellency from the United uh, Kingdom um, Embassy. Um, Alison Blackburn, uh, she is currently the British uh, High Commissioner, Acting High Commissioner uh, in Pakistan. She has been the British Ambassador to South Sudan before coming to Pakistan. She has also served as uh, High Commissioner to Uganda uh, in 2012 uh, to 2016. Um, uh, Alice Blackburn, the Her Excellency, has overseen uh, also in uh, administration in Warsaw, Stockholm, uh, New York, and Harare and Brussels as UK permanent representative uh, to the European Union. She's also served in Jakarta, Washington, and Moscow. Um, we very warmly welcome Her Excellency, uh, the High Commissioner, uh, to this 74th Independence Day celebration. Ambassador's um, Congress. Uh, while we, I request her to open, uh, while she opens her critical address, uh, that will be her message uh, from the UK to the people of Pakistan. So over to you, Your Excellency. Thank you very much. And I'm so pleased that we managed to resolve the, the technical issues. Uh, I have been listening with, with great interest to the discussion so far. And thank you so much for inviting me. And I if I can pass on the greetings of um, High Commissioner Christian Turner, who's taking a very well-deserved break. Um, but my, my message today, of course, is one of congratulations to Pakistan, to the people of Pakistan on Independence Day. And as others have been saying, these are extraordinary times and difficult times um, globally with the, with the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but it's, it's, it's really important to celebrate when there are some very positive things to, to do so. And today is certainly a, a, a time for celebration. 
Um, but uh, for the UK and Pakistan, I think it's also a time to reflect, reflect and celebrate on our partnership. So that's a, obviously a deep historic partnership, but it's a very modern partnership across all the, the sectors um, and the, uh, the work that the High Commission here does, that we work with your government and the people of Pakistan. Um, and I think it's, it's something which we can um, celebrate on both sides, including the, the really strong people to people links that we still have. You know, uh, uh, I think there's around uh, 1.5 million people in the UK who can claim some kind of family link to Pakistan. And at any t one time, we, we estimate there are around 100,000 British nationals here in Pakistan. So those, those figures are just a, a, a numerical example of how strong those people-to-people -people links are. And that's the, that's a, the bedrock of our, our relationship, which we certainly want to, um, to, to develop even further. But my main message is one of congratulations uh, to the people of Pakistan. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Um, uh, the last 73 years, um, there's a, there are great strands of relationship between the two countries um, in, in all given fields. Uh, why, and yes, uh, you rightly mentioned um, our very dear friend, uh, Dr. Christian Turner. Particularly, in fact, we love his tweets and we're going to miss him today. <laughs> but, but he definitely deserved um, this break after, after a very long um, phase of working very hard. So uh, I'm actually sitting right now in, in um, the East Surrey and I'm a bit sweltering here, 37 <laughs> Celsius, a bit unusual, um, uh, particularly with this tie and uh, no, no air con. Um, but uh, I'll be particularly uh, mentioning the 1.5 million uh, British Pakistani diaspora and uh, the contributions, in fact, um, the British Pakistani diaspora has been making, particularly um, in these turbulent circumstances. Uh, in the last four months, um, as I've been working very closely with uh, APPNE and APPS, um, these are the two medical organizations representing around 20,000 doctors uh, serving in the United Kingdom. And there have been heroic stories, heart rendering as well, but at the same time uplifting how these doctors and nurses and paramedics have been serving in our NHS uh, while serving uh, the British, uh, British citizens and above the call of duty. Um, I'll also mention One Million Meals, actually, uh, what um, I, uh, along with uh, Suleiman Raza and Bilal Sakib, uh, three of us, we set up uh, this particular organization to serve One Million Meals to to the NHS and, and key workers uh, during, during the lockdown. Um, and there are so many other stories. Uh, and yes, I shouldn't forget that I'm representing a here uh, in, in the UK, which is Pakistan's rather now the world's largest microfinance institution. So due to all this background, um, so, much is, well, so much is happening. Uh, and Pakistan is, it seems, winning its war against the coronavirus. How do you see uh, the contributions of the British Pakistanis in the UK, and at the same time, uh, how the government of Pakistan, the way they managed to win this war against the coronavirus. So thank you. There are two two important questions, as you as you mentioned. There are so many of the um, people in the diaspora in the in the in the UK who are um, involved in the in the fight against the, 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 the coronavirus in the UK, whether that's as members of the NHS or other key workers, or as um, part of a society as with every other society, which is having to um, take the responsibility for their own actions, to follow the SOPs, um, to, to keep the economy going, to keep schools going and so on, despite the challenges. So, and we're very grateful for the uh, for the efforts of the, the the diaspora in the UK, but the other side, of course, is is what is happening in Pakistan and um, a great focus of what we're doing at the High Commission over the last four or five months has been well. First of all, and I arrived at the end of February. I arrived in Pakistan at the end of February, and um, just really as the the coronavirus crisis was was going global um, and the impact was being felt in um, my own country in the UK, but also here in, in Pakistan. And for the High Commission, one of the things that we were focusing on was supporting British nationals who'd got stranded here in the UK to, to get back, uh, sorry, stranded in Pakistan rather, and wanted to get home to the UK. Uh, so we were focusing on that and we 
uh, had a big effort and uh, supported around 30,000 people to get back uh, to the UK. So that was a big focus of our work, but absolutely in parallel with, with that was how we could support Pakistan to combat the, uh, the, the virus. And so against a background, we already have a, a very large um, aid program here, as, as you will know, of over 200 million pounds. Um, we set about looking at what we could pivot and, and repurpose and what additional assistance we could give specifically on the fight against coronavirus um, and to help mitigate the impacts and support other areas like education and, um, and the uh, economy and business, economic development uh, during the, the, the crisis because, and also bearing in mind that this is not just going to be a quick crisis, it's going to be a protracted crisis. So it's about living with and trying to work through uh, a protracted period of coronavirus. So just to give a, uh, a couple of examples, so we, uh, we were the first donor or, and giving 4.39 million pounds to Pakistan's humanitarian pooled fund, and that includes supporting emergency response systems, food security, sanitation, hygiene, and other essential areas. And then we also um, contributed 2.67 million pounds to WHO to help the government of Pakistan to detect coronavirus and protect communities and, and help those most affected. We've also been looking at help with um, and, and uh, advice where where it's um, where we and where we can share experience on communications and so on. So we have been very focused on uh, continuing the work that we've already been doing because uh, there are uh, needs and programs which we want to continue to develop and, and things like education, girls' education, um, uh, and education more broadly. Um, but also seeing where we can particularly help uh, Pakistan and the government of Pakistan in their efforts uh, to, to fight, uh, to combat the, uh, the virus. As others have been saying, Pakistan has done um, remarkably well in, uh, in managing the impact of the, uh, the disease. Uh, the figures have been low um, and uh, although many people have uh, suffered and, and died and that, that, is a, that is a tragedy, uh, generally the Pakistani government, Pakistani authorities we think have done uh, very well in, in mitigating the impact and, and managing it. I think the key thing really is now to keep up that effort. As others have said before me, this is no time for complacency. You can see in in my own country, where we have also had a severe impact of the disease, uh, where we had a very strict lockdown nationally for uh, many weeks, uh, that is now starting to ease with the opening up of different areas of society and business. But accompanying that in the UK, very strict uh, application of SOPs, of measures, um, there, it is a responsibility of everybody to follow those and uh, if they don't then the government will come in with sanctions and fines and, uh, 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 and pa other penalties. And I see the same sort of thing happening in, in Pakistan with the easing of the measures here but as others have said it's really important that the SOPs are followed, uh, that everybody takes responsibility uh, to not be complacent, to follow the basic hygiene rules, wearing masks, uh, washing hands and so on, so that the really good progress that Pakistan has made is not, um, is not lost and that uh, the virus remains under control. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. You yeah, yeah, yeah. That we can, uh, we can further make progress over here because uh, yesterday the government of the United Kingdom actually um, increase the, the fines from the hundred pounds to three thousand two hundred pounds. Um, that might sound massive, but I think uh, for the right reasons, we definitely need to stick on, and we should never forget the virus is still around us. And in Pakistan, and in the U United Kingdom, and all those um, the British Pakistani diaspora who are actually watching this program to ensure that we stick to the SOPs and um, until it is over. And it seems that we have got to be cautious for the next couple of months before it's really, really over. Um, in my last comment, um, while we would like to um, hear something that you, as you recently arrived, uh, what you really liked about the culture, particularly 
uh, your love for curries or some, something that you do. Um, I would actually uh, mention one thing. Uh, Akhuva, Pakistan, has been uh, one of um, now the world's largest uh, microfinance institution, um, uh, microfinance uh, loan provider. Um, and uh, we understand that Pakistan has been the largest beneficiary of uh, the DFID, though things might change in the future. So we have uh, the privilege of having Akhuva's executive director here. Um, uh, um, education program and microfinance. Probably a quick comment from Dr. Saki before you leave. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, uh, Arif. You know, it's a great privilege to listen to uh, Her Excellency Allison. You know, you talked about people to people, you know, relationship uh, since centuries old relationship with the uh, uh, Britain, UK, and uh, Pakistani people. In our educated you know, families, uh, the names like uh, Shakespeare, Wordsworth, Bertrand Russell, and the you know, great statesman Churchill, and you know, all these are household names. So we, English language is a great, uh, you know, yeah, common- Yeah, some little go industry, how is the financial- uh, uh, the yes, So we truly value your, this relationship and truly value your support and uh, your cooperation and uh, you know, uh, especially during these uh, uh, testing times as well. Uh, we have, as, a, as an institution, Nahuwath has a very you know, uh, deep-rooted relations uh, with uh, people in the uh, UK. We are a registered charity in the United Kingdom, and we are getting support from BAT, that is the British Asian Trust, a charity which is headed by Prince Charles. Then we are also in collaboration with the uh, you know, Care International. They have a program of Lend with Care, so we are also linked with them. Then we are working in collaboration with Oxford University. We have developed a Sharia compliant, um, interest free microfinance product in uh, uh, collaboration with Oxford University. And quite recently, uh, 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 you know, a group of people from Oxford, they are uh, having uh, a research study mm -hmm. about the response of the a micro loan borrowers, uh, uh, you, know, you know, how this, imp uh, this coronavirus has impacted their life. And it is going to be one of the, you know, largest studies because they are uh, contacting nearly 10,000 people and would like to engage uh, their response. So we have a close relations and uh, uh, as uh, uh, mentioned by Mr. Arif Anis, he himself is one of the trustees of Hovath UK. So in that capacity, I would like to, you know, invite you to one of our offices whenever you are in Lahore or even in Islamabad. And I would also like uh, this privilege. It would be a great honor if you allow me to see and, you know, update you, especially our educational program, our program for women, our program for transgenders. So there are quite a different range of the programs which we are running for the extremely poor and uh, extremely marginalized uh, sections of society. And, uh, you know, we would also like to have some kind of uh, 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 relationship and support with the DFID and some other uh, uh, organizations uh, uh, which would like to develop some kind of, you know, uh, our online programs in the United Kingdom and uh, getting some support from your uh, best educational institutions and, uh, you know, support in terms of entrepreneurship, support in terms of, uh, you know, uh, learning English language, especially. So these are different areas, but uh, uh, let me appreciate your love for Pakistan and your appreciation for uh, our nation and uh, then your support uh, 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 during Corona virus. I think God specially selected you to come to Pakistan in February so that you can bring uh, good news for COVID and help us during this COVID. And uh, that will, you know, uh, 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 that will make you, make it convenient for you to further understand and go deep and see the misery and the, you know, and I must uh, uh, congratulate you on this Herculean effort of sending 30,000, you know, uh, British uh, uh, Pakistanis back to their homes. So uh, I, I'm sure you will be great uh, 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 you know, a friend of these 30,000 families and you can contest election there. These 30,000 families will be praying for you. So this is a great support. 
Thank you, so much. Thank, thank you, Dr. Sakib. Yes, you, Dr. Uh, your, your Excellency, your concluding comments. Well, your last <laughs> message of hope, of course. Last but not the least message of hope. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, I don't think I'll be standing for election anytime soon in the UK. I'm very happy with the job I've got here in, in Pakistan. But thank you for the, the kind comments and, uh, and the invitation to, uh, to visit the project and the, the programmes in, in Lahore. I hope to be able to take that up soon. So my, my final message, um, you know, I think, is, is one of hope. Um, uh, the, we've just been hearing about uh, what some work which is going on uh, uh, by Oxford University. There is also, uh, Oxford University is one of the places where work uh, is going on on a vaccine uh, where um, there is some hope with that, but no, no guarantees. And we're very proud that world-class UK science is, is in the vanguard of those efforts. And um, you know, we've been very clear about uh, the need for international cooperation in these difficult times, including on the search for a vaccine and making a vaccine available to everybody in the world. Um, the UK is very proud to be leading the international effort on that, not only in the science, but the, we, we hosted the uh, Global Vaccine Summit in, in June, which raised um, over $8 billion dollars for, um, for, for vaccine, the vaccine effort for, for Gavi. Um, so there is hope um, and uh, today the Independence Day of Pakistan is a day for celebration and hope uh, and hope and trust in our international collaboration and the partnership between the UK and Pakistan, which through these difficult times will go from strength to strength. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you. much, you. Uh, Excellency Ellison, and, and of course, seeing women leading this, uh, such an important position uh, it always gives me hope too, uh, and sharing stage. Thank you so much for your kind presence, and when we talk about women leaders, we have another excellent uh, ambassador, excellent uh, you know, leader uh, in his own form, in her own form, and is you know, standing tall there. Um, we have been joined by Ms. Androla, who is the ambassador of European Union in Pakistan and Ambassador Androla had took over the duties of as ambassador of, uh, you know, head of delegation of European Union in Pakistan in 2019. And prior to her, you know, presence here in Pakistan, and I still remember meeting her when, when this, this, you know, inauguration or meeting, first meeting was happening. You know, I've seen the excellent uh, a woman who are leading at the foreign policy level, especially at such an important positions, and uh, you know, sharing a few of the you know background of uh, 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 Excellency Androla is that she was there for Director for Africa, Asia, Latin America, Caribbean, and Pacific, and the Director General for European Civil Production and Humanitarian Aid Operations in the European Commission uh, in 2016. And as a result, he was uh, she was also their principal advisor, head of the task force knowledge, performance, and results in the Director General for International Cooperation and Development of the European Commission. And of course, this is Lester's career. We have seen her presence there as head of the European Cooperation Representation in Cyprus. And she was the Director of Quality of All Operations in the Head of Unit uh, Coordination of the Development Cooperation Projects uh, in the European Commission, um, and also remained as uh, you know part of uh, at, at very important positions, uh, I have seen that. And before joining the European Commission, um, uh, Excellency Androla was the special advisor to the two cabinet ministers in Greece and managing director of the private consultancies, of course. Uh, but her academic career is, is again uh, from King's College London and then, of course, uh, Imperial College London and then University there in Brussels, where she has completed her international politics. Uh, Excellency, welcome to the panel and thank you so so much for your kind presence here in this uh, important position, you know, time when difficult times and challenging times that we all are facing. Your opening remarks and your message for the people of Pakistan on the case. Hello, and, and thank you for these uh, welcoming words. I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you very much. Um, well, first of all, uh, let me let me say to uh, all Pakistanis, Tamam Pakistanio ko meris taraf se yome azadi pohot pohot mubarak. I hope uh, I did not uh, make a, too much of a mistake in the pronunciation. Uh, 
but uh, let me start with that um, message. Um, COVID, uh, the COVID challenge has challenged uh, every country in the world, uh, and, uh, but it has also taught us a lot of things. It has taught us that no, no country can, can be safe until all countries get rid of COVID. It has told us that um, uh, this pandemic does not make any uh, uh, discrimination either for poor or, or, health or wealthy, for um, women or men, for people in one country or another. And the underlying message there is that if we're going to fight COVID, we have to do it collectively in, in a spirit of uh, solidarity. In that context, the European Union from the beginning has uh, been quite instrumental in uh, grouping um, resources and grouping um, knowledge in order to uh, combat this pandemic. Uh, the European Union uh, realized uh, quite early on that uh, there has to be increased efforts in ensuring that a vaccine is found. Uh, we were instrumental in launching a, a global um, pledging conference that took place in May where over 7 billion euros were actually pledged. Out of that uh, one, uh, 7 billion euros, 1.4 billion of that was European Union money. And let me tell you that uh, the other thing which I think is as equally important um, is the realization and the push by the European Union to ensure that um, the intellectual property rights and uh, restrictions vis-a-vis -vis that does not slow down the progress of um, researchers, because if that was a, a factor that would play into, uh, into the um, effort to find the vaccine, it will probably take a, a few years before there will be any development. So uh, we not only um, push for funds to be made available, but also to ensure that whatever it, vaccine is found, this will be made available at uh, uh, prices that will be um, um, possible for all to have access to. There are currently over a hundred consortia of uh, researchers financed from that fund, which are actually looking into um, uh, finding a vaccine. Now, with what concerns uh, Pakistan, uh, EU uh, efforts, to help Pakistan in the COVID response. Um, we, in, we are announced in June, I think one of the um, biggest um, development cooperation and humanitarian aid package, a package of 150 million euros, uh, which um, had the whole spectrum of uh, activities from pure humanitarian, providing uh, PPE to uh, hospitals to supporting, for example, the, um, uh, the Lady Reading Hospital in Peshawar to have a specialized uh, COVID uh, ward, to training nurses, to, but also at the more um, provincial level, we've also worked with um, making sure that we uh, provide additional budget support to some of these provinces because they, they needed to uh, have additional resources to, to react. Um, and um, just another one to uh, announce that we recently uh, launched a call for proposal for 6.65 million, which would go towards having uh, local uh, uh, NGOs contribute at the local level throughout the country on uh, combating uh, um, COVID. So um, we have partnered, we have reacted from the beginning, and uh, we, we, we are uh, working very closely with the government. Thank you, Thank Your you Excellency. So uh, your Urdu is very good, Your Urdu is really good, in fact. We're all are really impressed. Um, thank you so much for, for highlighting um, the thank strands you. of collaboration between the European Union and Pakistan, and we shouldn't actually miss out on the DSP+. Plus. Um, I think this is one of the Thank biggest you. advantage. Uh, we have been campaigning for it, say, five, six years back, and uh, Pakistan uh, can definitely take a huge benefit of the USP+, Plus, which is uh, one of the big favors uh, from the EU community. Uh, Your Excellency, while you have seen Pakistan 
fighting its war against the COVID-19. Uh, what are your observations? Because we've got the good news that the cases are receding and Pakistan is mm -hmm. coming out of uh, uh, the, like, from the hot spot or the hotbed of coronavirus, coming, emerging as, mm -hmm. as a winner. So could you highlight your personal observations, what went good and how other countries could learn from them? Okay, uh, I'd like to start by also addressing the, the GSP plus um, uh, question that you posed. Um, through GSP plus, uh, the trade figures between uh, um, Pakistan and the EU have drastically increased. Um, the EU is the number one destination of Pakistani goods. Uh, we are about 33% uh, of all Pakistani goods go to the EU. Uh, the next uh, are, um, is the US. I think it's about half of that and one third of that is China. Just to sh show you the, um, the importance of this trade relationship. And over uh, from 2018 to 2019, there was a 9% increase of uh, exports from Pakistan into the EU. This is huge, particularly in, in the context of in the context of um, a well um, economic situation where most exports from most countries, at best, were at the same level and not uh, were not increasing. So we're very very proud of that relationship, and I think also Pakistan has been um, extremely successful, and uh, I think uh, has to be commended on on the fact that. Uh, uh, the figures have been increasing year and uh, year on year, and at quite in in in, um, in uh, impressive levels. Now, with respect to um, uh, how Pakistan has been reacting to COVID, it has been absolutely fascinating to be here from the beginning and to uh, follow the the evolving, let's say, situation uh, in Pakistan, and also to compare with some of the uh, reactions from uh, European countries and other countries globally. I think the fact that the um, the numbers have the the numbers of new infections per day have gone down so uh, dramatically uh, can only be a, a factor for which uh, Pakistan can be uh, needs to be congratulated. Uh, what has caused that, that um, reduction? Uh, I think uh, we will not know. Uh, uh, until detailed studies are done in the beginning, for sure the measures that the government has taken um, have uh, been successful, but whether or not there are other factors that are also influencing those figures, um, only the, the specialists uh, will know after detailed study. One thing to say is for sure the, the average age here in Pakistan, uh, being around uh, 20 uh, years old by comparison to the average age in, let's say, in Europe, which would be uh, at least twice as much in, in most countries, has played a role. Um, other, other factors potentially could be playing a role, but uh, as I said, that is yet to be investigated. Um, the other thing I would like to say is that in most countries, we are seeing now uh, a second uh, potential wave. We do not know if a second wave will have to will, uh, take place here, or if for the same reasons that there are um, low um, infections rates right now, uh, for the same uh, reasons, or because of um, the actions of the government, there will not be a second wave. But it's very, very important that in this context, with this, um, this current knowledge of how the, um, uh, the virus spreads, it is very, very important to um, underline that uh, there are still dangers from COVID. There is still the need for people to wear masks, to uh, social distance, to be um, uh, to follow the uh, SOPs, to wash hands. We are not not here. I would say not anywhere in the world. We're not out of the the woods. So uh, being focused and and vigilance has to be has to be uh, maintained. Thank you so much, Excellency Androla, for your you know, brilliant remarks, especially the relationship between Pakistan and European Union. And of course, uh, you know, the work that uh, I always feel privileged and honored to, to see women thriving there, you know. And, you know, um, uh, Excellency Androla, I, I 
without any you know jealousy with any men but you know world is safer and prosperous because of us women leading at the such highest positions um and excellency your what is your favorite cuisine here in pakistan i see you saw you there in you know um you know eating mangoes <laughs> in the tweet before <laughs> before i ask you to uh, share the message of hope for the people of pakistan okay uh First of all, on the, on the women aspects, I have to say that I have been hugely impressed by Pakistani women that I have met. And, uh, and also to say that um, not just here, but globally, there are more difficulties in a woman achieving a certain position than men. This is without a question of a doubt. I have also seen it in my own uh, career. If you are the minority, the the hurdles through which you have to step through are higher. So Pakistani women that actually make it uh, have uh, prominent positions, I am sure have been have have to be at least uh, not only as good as the men, but at least uh, considerably uh, better. Now this is no um, uh, let's say disrespect to the men, but it's a, it's a reality uh, that we have to uh, recognize. About uh, uh, my um, mango eating uh, photograph, I was really devouring that. And I, I had said to myself, because a lot of people were posting uh, photographs of mango eating, I said, I will not do it. Uh, you know, and enough people eating uh, mango, but that day I was caught on camera devouring it and I decided to post it. I thought, uh, I hope uh, people got a smile at least from, uh, from that. Um, Pakistani food that I like, uh, I like, uh, uh, for example, uh, palet paneer very much. I like uh, chicken biryani, and I like uh, the baolap jamen. I have, uh, I think, some of the kilos I've gained since I've been here are, are a result of uh, these irresistible <laughs> delicacies of uh, uh, Pakistan. Your message of hope, Excellency. Okay. Um, there, there is a, a, a more global message of hope, the one I started off with, that uh, the world has seen with the COVID pandemic, that we are all connected. Somebody else's health also affects ours and our health and our responsibility on how we uh, protect ourselves and others with the COVID affects others. So I think uh, this global need to work together in solidarity to solve uh, global problems, not just the pandemic, but things like uh, things, big issues like climate change has been become uh, much more prominent than ever before. And I hope the message uh, is sort of um, not forgotten um, in the near future. With what concerns uh, Pakistan, I can uh, uh, say that the way that uh, Pakistan has handled the, the um, COVID uh, pandemic has, has led to very positive results, which are, are less people getting infected with time. So that is a very uh, positive um, development. And that uh, Pakistan has such huge potential. I, I have traveled extensively in the country and I wish to continue traveling extensively one, uh, once the COVID um, uh, uh, restrictions are lifted. And every place I go, I am just amazed about the potential. The potential, not, not just, um, again, uh, uh, the men, but the, the women, a society whereby you have hardworking, uh, very positive attitude people, very hospitable people, in an um, absolutely stunning, stunningly beautiful uh, place with uh, uh, prosperity that can be achieved, uh, growth rates that can be achieved that can uh, really be for the benefit of all. So um, my message is continue on that path of prosperity, accelerate reforms, include everybody in that development. And I'm sure uh, Pakistan's future will not only be um, 
uh, as bright as it has it is right now, but it will shine brighter in the future. Not just for Pakistan, for the region, and also uh, for the whole international community. So, God Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. And um, we are so grateful for these uplifting words. And it, it seems that you're enjoying your experience in Pakistan, um, along with the mangoes. And, and yes, that, <laughs> that, 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 that image, in fact, it, it has gone viral. Um, I hope uh, you, 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 would, you would continue appreciating the cuisine and, and the culture as you still have. Thank you so much. I'll be proceeding to the next guest. And once again, we have uh, uh, our distinguished uh, guest from, from the Federal Republic of Germany. Um, His Excellency, Dr. Philip uh, Dittmann, who is Deputy Head of Mission and Child Affairs Embassy of Federal Republic of Germany. Dr. Philip Dittmann is a PhD and he's charged of his deputy head of mission. Um, he is uh, serving in Pakistan. Um, and he's also head of division for foreign trade promotion. So we welcome Dr. Dijban from the Federal Republic of Germany to join us um, at this ambassador's Obertan of Congress. And I would request um, His Excellency to initiate uh, his opening remarks by mainly congratulating uh, the people of Pakistan on the 74th day of independence uh, and as a message from the Federal Republic of Germany. Thank you very much for your very uh, kind words of introduction. And uh, indeed, let me start with sincere congratulations on the occasion of this year's anniversary of Pakistan's independence. It is a pleasure and an honor for me to spend this special day with you and uh, all the viewers of this online event. This year, Independence Day celebrations take place amidst very special circumstances. The pandemic and its effects on our social life has deeply affected all of us. Instead of big gatherings, of parades, of festivities, several events on Pakistan's Independence Day, like this one, can take place only virtually. The pandemic has taught us that international cooperation is essential to successfully overcome global challenges like the current one. The long-standing close and trustful bilateral relations between our two countries will serve as a very good basis, I, think, I hope. By the way, we will celebrate 70 years of German-Pakistani bilateral relations next year. The joint fight against the novel virus and its socio-economic uh, consequences is a new facet of the many-sided trustful cooperation between our two countries. As my ambassador, who is for the time being on leave in Germany, has underlined at uh, other occasions, quotation, let us try together to overcome economic hardships and bring relief to the vulnerable. With German, financial, with German financial support and the framework of multilateral organizations, as well as bilateral support to fight COVID-19 in Pakistan, Germany would like to underline that it stands side by side with the Pakistani people in these trying times. End of quotation. Overall, this year, Germany provides additional COVID-19 related assistance of around 1 billion euros. About half of this amount is earmarked for worldwide humanitarian and development assistance projects, both on a multilateral, multilateral and on a bilateral level. These funds will contribute to global relief measures in countries already facing a humanitarian crisis. The other half of the amount is earmarked for the EU coronavirus global response, whose aim is, amongst others, uh, the de development of vaccine against COVID-19. Germany is thus making a substantial contribution in response to the global humanitarian appeals from the United Nations and others. Most of German financial support is realized through multilateral institutions such as World Bank or Asian Development Bank. 
But I think on this occasion, the most important is once again to underline that we really um, uh, convey our heartfelt congratulations on the occasion of Pakistan's Independence Day and all the best wishes to all Pakistanis. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank <clears> you so <throat> much, uh, Dr. Philip, for your presence. It's such an important message of uh, hope and, of course, uh, the work that the German Embassy, under the supervision of you and, of course, uh, Excellency Ambassador of German, uh, Germany in Pakistan. Uh, my question, uh, and of course, the important one, is that especially uh, the student exchange and the relationship in the, in the, in the realm of education, uh, where both countries are collaborating for so many years. Um, in this pandemic, uh, what kind of steps that the German embassy is taking, uh, especially in relation to the providing scholarships to the students, uh, assisting those students who are traveling to Germany uh, for studying and uh, pursuing their higher education, in, uh, you know, because those students are always remain as our asset and working at various levels uh, as uh, German alumni in Pakistan. And, and contributing in, in a tremendous manner. So what are the steps that the German embassy has been taking uh, so far, has taken so far uh, over the time period of this pandemic? A very good question, but uh, the answer is uh, maybe uh, not so very positive. Uh, during, our, uh, during the pandemic since, uh, during, uh, during the pandemic lockdown since March or April this year, um, parts of the embassy really were closed, especially uh, the visa section. And this for the time going um, is still, um, has, not yet, has not yet been changed for the time being. Of course, we are uh, working on, especially on visa applications for students and for some other groups as well. Um, but uh, it is not yet the normal level of work. I hope, uh, of course, that this will be uh, changed um, in the next uh, maybe day, uh, maybe weeks. Um, but a decision uh, among the European states uh, have not yet been um, taken. But still, oh, there's thanks. always a hope. Uh, Gia Arisa. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Your Excellency. While uh, we are putting you on spot, in fact, um, we hope that you've learned a bit of Urdu as well. And if you can, share your bit of a message in Urdu, uh, if that's not that difficult. Uh, while you do this, I will also invite you to, to share your message of hope uh, for Pakistan and on for, for the bilateral relationships between the two countries. Yes, of course. Thank you very much. Uh, of course, my message is, uh, of hope uh, goes very much with the title of uh, this conference, Surviving Corona and Coming Out Stronger uh, Together Afterwards. I'm convinced, I'm really convinced that this is the case. Yes, we can survive Corona and we can come out stronger afterwards. And this is, uh, the reason for that is that under pressure of the virus threat to our health, we have developed strategies to protect ourselves while continuing as far as possible our traditional work and life overall in the world, in Pakistan and in Germany as well. First of these strategies, protection of health. As we all know how the virus spreads, we have to follow established SOPs to intercept the virus before it enters our bodies. This, of course, is the responsibility of really everybody. Second of the strategies, reorganization of work. Wherever possible, work should be decentralized. For many, working from home becomes the new normalcy. Video calls and virtual meetings, for example, this con online conference of today, start to replace physical meetings. The same goes for school and universities, where crowded lessons are really not necessary and can be avoided. Digitalization of our life is key and of our economy as well. And creativity, of course, knows no limits. Third of the strategies and most complicated. It is research for vaccination and medication. There are hundreds of companies and institutions around the world committed to this objective. Nobody knows how long it will take for the breakthrough, but we should be confident that in the end, we will have better medication and perhaps even vaccination against this virus. Four, the value of international cooperation. Nobody can, fight, nobody can fight successfully alone against the virus. 
we all need coordination of measures. And thanks to WHO, to the World Health Organization, which is also very, um, uh, very well represented here in Pakistan, we can rely on a renowned international partner. So let me finish by expressing my confidence that we will come out stronger of this crisis if everybody does his or her very best. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Excellency Dr. Uh, Philip, uh, for your remarks, for your presence, and sharing the message of hope with the people of Pakistan. We are entirely grateful. Um, we are honored that today uh, we have also been joined by uh, Ambassador of uh, Ambassador of uh, um, Indonesia in Pakistan. He is here uh, since 2016 and has, has a tremendous and excellent career uh, representing Indonesia at different positions in the United States, um, in UN, United Nations, in Beijing, in ASEAN as well. And, you know, serving at such important positions and uh, has remained as Ambassador of Indonesia, Republic of Indonesia in Pakistan and has a, you know, tremendous amount of work that he's been doing. Uh, we welcome Excellency Mr. Evan uh, at the podium, at the, at the panel. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, there you are. Thank you so much for your presence. Your remarks on the occasion, Excellency. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Farad Asif. So, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, at first, I would like to thank the Institute of uh, Peace and uh, Diplomatic Studies for the kind invitation to participate in this Hopton Ambassador Congress with the thematic aim of uh, surviving a Corona coming out stronger together. I appreciate uh, the initiative of uh, IPD uh, to organize this Congress on this uh, important topic during this testing uh, pandemic time. Uh, I wish to uh, convey my uh, heartiest uh, felicitations and best wishes to the government and the brotherly people of Pakistan on the auspicious occasion of the 73rd Independence Day of Pakistan uh, today. Uh, Indonesia and Pakistan uh, have been enjoying excellent uh, diplomatic relations uh, since independence, based on mutual trust, uh, common interests, and shared uh, values. Uh, the marked feature of our fraternal ties are a strong people-to-people -people, uh, connections, which are unique in nature as they were established even before uh, the independence of uh, two countries. Uh, as a friend and partner of Pakistan, the significant economic progress and strengthening of democratic norms in Pakistan are heartening to see for us. On this special day, I sincerely congratulate my Pakistani friends on this achievement and wish more peace and prosperity in the years ahead. Uh, as regard to the thematic aim of this Congress, uh, surviving Corona, uh, coming out stronger together, I'm pleased to reiterate that Indonesia is always uh, supportive and willing to work together with Pakistan in the battle against pandemic. At this uh, critical time, Indonesia and Pakistan are facing almost similar uh, challenges due to a uh, large population and economic uh, pressure. Uh, the success story of Pakistan against uh, pandemic is very impressive indeed. As mentioned in the Wall Street Journal uh, recent report, and we see also with the same during uh, the last uh, uh, six months. So both of which are uh, the sub decline in, 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 in COVID-19 cases uh, and death in Pakistan, uh, both of which are down over 80% uh, from, the, from their peaks deserve all our price. I sincerely uh, congratulate the government and people of Pakistan on this uh, wonderful uh, achievement. Uh, we have a great history of helping each other at uh, the time of every uh, natural calamity. 
uh, we fully understand uh, that protecting lives of our citizens and to run the wheel of economy at the same time is not an easy task for countries with limited avail available uh, resources like uh, in Indonesia and also in Pakistan. Uh, in this scenario, I must appreciate the strategy uh, adopted by uh, Pakistan to contain the COVID-19, uh, such as uh, smart uh, lockdown. I think Pakistan, since the beginning, the first country who adopt the policy of uh, smart lockdown, uh, monitoring through NCONC, uh, creation of uh, Tiger Force, and economic stimulus package to protect a vulnerable segment of uh, society and small uh, businesses. Uh, in this regard, I also wish to pay my sincere tribute to dedicated Pakistani doctors and paramedic staff who uh, risk and even sacrifice their own lives to contain pandemic. As uh, frontline heroes, their self a selfless uh, contribution and sacrifices in the line of duty set an example to remember what humanity is all about. In addition, I am very grateful to the Pakistan authorities, especially the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and uh, Pakistan International Airways for extending their full support and cooperation in smooth repatriation of stranded Indonesian citizens in Pakistan during the lockdown restriction. Uh, to conclude, I wish to work together more closely to explore a new dimension of our dynamic relationship. Uh, during the recent years, the frequent high-level exchanges from both sides uh, remain very productive especially the official uh, visit by the Indonesian president, Mr. Joko Widodo, in 2018, had been very successful. Several important MOUs and agreements were signed, giving a significant boost to our growing bilateral cooperation. I look forward to deepening of this mutually beneficial ties in the years ahead. Thank you. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Yes, Kassir Abbasov, you want to go ahead and ask the question? You're muted, Kassir. Oh, yeah, I'm yeah. Yeah, yeah I think it's unmuted. Uh, my question is, uh, since I studied psychology, and psychology says that humans are more tilted toward hopelessness. So they easily get distracted and it, they, they find solace and they find a lot of, you know, satisfaction in being a little bit of hopeless. So what is, what, what do you think, what you've been doing as a country to spread a sense of hopefulness amongst your people? Very uh, <laughs> a challenging question, but very important in particular in this time of crisis. So uh, it happened this morning. Uh, the Indonesian president made a speech in front of the member of the parliament because we are going to celebrate the uh, 75th of our uh, independence uh, this coming uh, uh, Monday. And uh, as uh, state procedures, normally two days or one day before, the president has to speak before the parliament both the budget plan and the strategy uh, to uh, cope with the problem and to uh, make the new program for development. So uh, he said, we have to use this crisis as a momentum. Even he said the exact word, we have to hijack the crisis for us to change totally our approach and mindset. So we cannot anymore just doing business as usual, but we have to uh, think and act out of the box. So 
this is, I think, it's very uh, momentous statement because, as you rightly said, uh, in most country, including in my country in particular, we are facing very uh, extraordinary and unique situation because of the uh, pandemic. So even in terms of economy, this is even the worst uh, crisis uh, we uh, human being experience so far. And this crisis is not only related to the economic, but psychological also because we have been locked down for more than five months. So psych psycho uh, psychologically, as you, you said, we actually, but Alhamdulillah, as we are a religious country, we believe in one God, even though we believe trustfully to our effort, but of course nothing will happen without a God help. So for us, uh, uh, as uh, uh, Indonesia, uh, which is a diverse uh, country, we believe in one God. So we have to always believe, even though we are strong as human beings, but at the end of the day, we have to hang fully our hope to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's one, uh, one, one way how uh, we have to be resilient in facing this very uh, challenging time. Thank you. Excellent. So belief in God and then being able to see the opportunity in the crisis by shifting the mindset from focusing on the loss and towards focusing on the gain. I think uh, it's one of the finest strategies that most of the leaders uh, been recommending and using uh, amidst crisis. Uh, so thank, thank you so much. Really appreciate your answer. Uh, thank you so much, Excellency, for the brilliant uh, introduction and your message of hope on this this Independence Day when we all are sharing hope and togetherness here. Your message of hope from the people of Indonesia to people of Pakistan. Uh, so before the message, let me just a bit give the uh, background how close uh, we are between Indonesia and Pakistan. So in this uh, uh, very uh, a good time, let me express on behalf of the government and people of Indonesia uh, sincere appreciation to Pakistan because uh, during the 1945, uh, right after our independence, the at that time uh, still British uh, India, so the uh, Kuwait Azam sending uh, 600 troops from Pakistan to Indonesia. It was initially intended to assist the British, the British troop. But when they landed uh, uh, in Indonesia, in particular in the second biggest city in, in, in Surabaya, uh, actually the troop from India is intended to fight the, 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 the fighter of uh, Indonesia. But when they hear the Azan, they deserve it and they take side to Indonesia. So in this special occasion, because uh, our independent days is given only two days, so we sincerely thanks to, to, to Pakistan. So uh, my message to, to sister and brothers of Pakistan, so congratulate for uh, Independence Day of, of Pakistan, 73rd. So we, I have been here in Pakistan for uh, more than four years, and we witness uh, closely how resilient the Pakistani in uh, facing a very complex and unique challenges, even uh, since the independence, but still Pakistan is exist and even progressive. So uh, I wish Pakistani all the best and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless uh, always to brother and sister of Pakistani. So Pakistan, Zindabad, thank you. Thank you so much, Excellency, for your uh, presence. And of course, I mean, this is this is togetherness is so overwhelming that you know it is it is tremendous. Um, thank you so much, Excellency, for your kind presence. And I'm honored that uh, Ambassador of um, Japan is here, uh, Excellency Matsuda, who is who is, has remained as ambassador in Pakistan for quite a while. And of course, uh, the presence and uh, the background of Excellency. Uh, ambassador of Japan in Pakistan has remained, uh, you know, instrumental uh, in developing the relationship um, over the.
time period uh, when Excellency Ambassador Matsuda became the Director of Overseas Public Relations Division and Ministry of Foreign Affairs and later served at important positions at different uh, countries, including direct, uh, you know, serving, uh, serving as the Director of Russian Division at the Ministry and then uh, Embassy of Japan in Israel, of course, and then Consul General, Consulate General in Japan, in the road, and then, of course, uh, you know, serving a different position, important position, in fact, um, and, and outlining and, for, uh, you know, uh, increasing the uh, foreign policy goals of Japan in different countries. Um, he has remained in, in Hong Kong as well, and before serving in Pakistan since 2018, um, he has remained uh, as ambassador of, uh, you know, Consul General of Japan in Hong Kong. So welcome, uh, Excellency Matsuda for your kind presence um, here in this panel and sharing a message of messages of hope, uh, messages of love and togetherness. Uh, Ambassador Matsuda, your uh, opening remarks on the occasion. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much for your very kind introduction. And thank you to Institute for Peace and Diplomatic Studies for organizing this web congress. And particularly, thank you very much for having me in it. First of all, to all my dear Pakistani friends, congratulations on the 74th Independence Day. I also would like to commend the people and the government of Pakistan for gradually winning a fight against COVID-19 pandemic. Now today, let me first share with you Japan's experience in dealing with COVID-19. The expansion of COVID-19 in Japan has hit its peak in April. And since then, Japan has overcome this situation only after one and a half months and after we declared a state of emergency. Of course, it was a difficult decision, but under the state of emergency, we try very hard to keep a balance between life and livelihood. And we have somehow contained the number of the infections and the fatalities per, per capita, the very small number today. Why is our approach to deal with COVID-19 more or less successful so far? The factors which have contributed to a good performance as follows. First, the discipline of the ordinary Japanese people when faced with crisis. This helps a lot the government of Japan in implementing SOPs in the society. Second, Japan's cluster-based approach in which our ethical experts identify common sources which cause cluster infections through active epidemiological investigations so that we delay and minimize further spread of COVID-19 by taking quick and very much focused response measures without breaking our medical capacity in the country. Third, the concept of Sammitsu or three seeds in English which our medical experts have advocated as an easily understandable message for infection prevention and avoidance. Three C's, by the way, stand for closed spaces with poor ventilation, crowded places with many people nearby, and close contact settings such as close range conversations. Through very active public education and public relations efforts, government Japan and organizations in society encourage people to avoid three seeds. Four, good access to medical care supported by the universal health coverage system, sufficient public private medical institutions, and generally high quality medical medical care also very helpful in our efforts to fight against COVID-19. And the Japanese people's high standard and recognition of hygiene, including washing hands and wearing masks, 
is well established in Japan even long before the outbreak of the pandemic. And last but not least, there are cultural traits in Japan, including bowing instead of handshaking or hugging as a gesture of greeting, or keeping silence in the public space and so on. These cultural traits are also very helpful for stopping and controlling spread of COVID-19. Now, let me turn to the Japan's cooperation with Pakistan so far. Now, the global spread of COVID-19 is a huge threat to the entire world because people-to-people -people exchange and trade of goods have developed globally. Therefore, close international cooperation is indispensable. I emphasize that no country can stand alone to deal with the pandemic alone. In this sense, Japan is ready and willing to continue to support countries with vulnerable health care and medical systems. As we all know, there is a famous saying, a friend in need is a friend indeed. As this saying goes, Japan and Pakistan have a very good history of helping each other in the event of natural disasters and emergencies for nearly 70 years since the establishment of diplomatic relations, in spite of the fact that we have different religious and cultural backgrounds. Our cooperation in the Northern Pakistan earthquake in the year 2005, or the Great East Japan earthquake in the year 2011, a good example of strong friendship and mutual support. As far as the COVID-19 is concerned, Japan had already delivered diagnostic kits to Pakistan on February 4th, three weeks before the first case was even announced in Pakistan. Since then, we have provided financial and material support. And as of today, Japan's assistance to Pakistan amounts to about 8 million US dollars. And we will continue to work with Pakistan in its efforts to control the infection with due consideration to the needs of people in Pakistan. Now, in this connection, I would like to particularly mention necessity of clean water supply in Pakistan. Japan has supported a total of 16 water and sewage projects in cities such as Islamabad, Karachi, Lahore, Faisalabad, Abbottabad, and Gujranwala over the past 30 years. Because we strongly believe that stable clean water supply is the most important and fundamental element to overcome not only COVID-19, but also any kind of the infectious diseases in Pakistan and all over the world. Now, lastly, I'd like to turn to future cooperation in the post-corona or with corona era. A huge and global challenge brought by COVID-19 will surely need a new international norm and order in the post-corona year. We all have to cooperate to address challenges such as revitalizing the global economy, debt relief for developing countries, and developing and providing new pharmaceutical treatments and vaccines against COVID-19 or any other new infectious disease through international frameworks. A unilateral, even a selfish approach by a single country will damage concerted efforts of countries in the world. Furthermore, COVID-19 cast a big question mark on the current socio-economic model itself. In this sense, Japan has already started discussions among us on the future outlook of the post-corona with corona society, including a workforce or a household lifestyles. And these new models 
I think Japan and Pakistan will find new opportunities for further cooperation. For example, Pakistan's IT talent will be essential for the promotion of a digital transformation on the society, which is sure to support the new working style. In this sense, I think the demand for Pakistan's high skilled IT workers will surely grow in Japan. Also, in terms of the adaptability of changes in the world economy, it is very important to secure resilience by decentralizing and diversifying the global supply chain. This will further enhance the attractiveness of Pakistan with its strong workforce basis and regional connectivity as an investment destination for many Japanese and other foreign companies. Now, if there's any silver lining with COVID-19, it has clearly reiterated the necessity of strengthening international cooperation and solidarity in solving other global issues for sustainability, including environmental issues such as climate change, disaster prevention, and mitigations. So, in the conclusion, I can assure you to the audience that Japan is ready and willing to work with Pakistan and other friendly countries. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency. And um, you rightly shed light on the deep-rooted relationship between the two countries. Um, um, we share a lot of respect for each other. And um, particularly in Pakistan, uh, there's great love for Japanese uh, ways of life, um, discipline, and uh, definitely uh, your high-tech industry uh, that is considered actually a symbol of quality uh, in Pakistan. Whenever someone mentions something is Japanese made, that's actually considered the, of the highest quality uh, uh, ever present in the market. So with this background, uh, I'll be actually asking the last question and concluding it. Uh, one, if you could kindly uh, share, half the question is if you could kindly share your personal experience of Pakistani culture and Pakistani food, and what is your favorite? Uh, just to give it a personal touch, uh, while you share the message of hope uh, from Japan to Pakistan, uh, while Pakistan actually is coming out of uh, the coronavirus crisis slowly uh, due to the smart lockdown strategy, if you have any comment on that. Uh, there is a question uh, from a uh, technical side uh, some of the some of the attendees want to know that uh, there has been labor immigration contracts signed between the two countries. If there is any update on that, that would be great, Your Excellency. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Let me start with you know, the uh, last questions. Uh, as we recall, that uh, Japan, after heated discussions among uh, uh, government officials and society. Finally, we decided to open our labor market. And we have designated dozens of countries based on our uh, track record of their communities in Japan. And Pakistan is one of them with which we have we signed MOU uh, to create a new working visa regimes. Now, unfortunately, COVID-19 suspended our internal efforts, both sides, but uh, as soon as the situation in, uh, under control, we would like to resume our concrete steps to uh, invite a Pakistani highly skilled workers come to live and work in Japan. Uh, we have set a goal for next five years to invite up to 350,000 foreign workers come to live and work in Japan. And personally, at least, uh, I'd like to see that the 30,000 Pakistanis are going to apply for the working visas in Japan. Now, uh, regarding the, uh, uh, sorry, your uh, second question was what? About uh, uh, your love, your cuisine, your love for Pakistani cuisine. What is your favorite? Uh, cultural cuisine, <laughs> actually, what, what might uh, attract you? Well, thank you very much. Now, you know, we are now 
try to increase our import of the Pakistani mangoes and basmati oh. rice. Now, for those of you who might surprise to see that you know, Japan is a country with our own uh, short, sticky rice, but because of the more and more foreigners uh, living in Japan and also younger generations who prefers to eat long you know, uh, rice, so uh, demand for the basmati rice actually is increasing. So uh, let me take this opportunity to encourage uh, anyone who are interested in uh, export basmati rice or mangoes or any other fruits or vegetables to Japan because our agriculture market is also open to uh, Pakistani goods. And as far as I'm concerned, you know, uh, here in Pakistan, I started to cultivate my taste for lamb, which, you know, I seldom ate back in Japan. <laughs> Your message of hope, Excellency. Your now, message of hope, you know, Yes. Now, uh, let me say a few words about first, importance of, you know, uh, making a balance, keeping a balance between the life and the livelihood. Uh, and as I you know, what you call a uh, very smart uh, lockdown. Now, uh, under different titles and different namings, this is exactly what Japan, government Japan, the Japan society is now seeking to realize. Now, like it or not, we have to live with the COVID-19 or other new types of the infectious disease into the future. So definitely we need to come up with a new uh, system under which we can uh, keep a balance between life and livelihood. For that matter, I think that, you know, Pakistan is one of the leading countries try to set a you know, model for other countries to follow. For that matter, uh, as a diplomat stationed in, Japan, uh, in Pakistan, I closely following the development of your uh, smart lockdowns uh, with, uh, you know, cooperations between the provincial, central government, as well as the society in Pakistan at large. And this is what I see that uh, hope for the future. Thank you so much, Excellency, for your kind presence and sharing the message of hope. Uh, our next guest today is Excellency Ambassador of Italy to Pakistan, His Excellency Mr. Andreas. Thank you so much for your kind presence and uh, sharing sharing the stage and being at the panel. Um, your own career and some of your different positions in uh, and for forwarding uh, the uh, foreign policy goals of Italy at different levels. Um, we have seen your career, you're in serving at commercial relations in Asia, of course, uh, in Manila, in Tel Aviv, in Beirut, and later you had remained as ambassador of Italy to uh, in, in Kosovo as well. Um, and since 2020, you know, in February, you have arrived here in Pakistan. And you, in 2016, you have also been uh, given the official night of the Order of Merit of the Italian Republic. Uh, thank you so much and welcome to Pakistan Excellency, your kind remarks on the occasion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this invitation and congratulations for the organization. First of all, I want uh, to send my warmest uh, greetings to all the participants and uh, to congratulate most of all the government uh, and the people of Pakistan for the National Day. Uh, this is a very important seminar and a very important subject, of course, uh, very, of, uh, very important for uh, everybody's everyday life here in Pakistan and all around the world. First of all, I would like to send a sincere thank to the government of Pakistan and to the armed forces of Pakistan for the help and support they provided to Italy in the most difficult moments of this crisis. I, we received the expression of solidarity through a visit to our embassy by His uh, Excellency, Minister of uh, Qureshi. He came to Embassy of Italy to express solidarity to Italian people in the very beginning of the crisis. We received the uh, a lot of support even from the armed forces in the most difficult moments. Uh, we had contacts between our Prime Minister uh, Giuseppe Conte and Prime Minister Imran Khan 
and uh, between the uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs Di Maio and uh, uh, His Excellency Qureshi. This is the result of a long story of collaboration, of friendship, real friendship between our two countries. A collaboration which is continuing and will continue as much stronger after the crisis. In Italy, we are active uh, with a good bilateral trade and also with assistance in the social sector, archaeology, and also for the preservation of the mountain heritage and the environment. We, to, we wish to continue to collaborate and uh, further increase in the next uh, weeks and months. We have to overcome this crisis together, to defeat this virus together, and to build a better and stronger and richer future together. That's why I will work with all my staff uh, very hardly in collaboration with uh, the government to make these targets come true. So thank you very much again for the invitation and uh, please uh, rely on uh, Italy and uh, in all the Italian citizens uh, on behalf of whom I express also the sympathy and solidarity for the victims of, uh, of the virus in uh, Pakistan. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. And um, uh, would, you, would you kindly accept our heartfelt condolences to all the lives lost in Italy? And um, it's great to see actually Italy coming out of uh, the crisis and um, getting uh, actually staying ahead of the curve um, and making great progress because it became uh, one big hot spot uh, in the last two months. Um, Italy is now um, has successfully uh, come out of it um, with greater controls. And you have observed Pakistan also winning this war against the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, would you kindly share? some of the best practices that you have noticed the government of Pakistan, uh, particularly when it comes to the coronavirus, um, which war against coronavirus, that benefited Italy and that benefited Pakistan as well. Well, uh, I observed with great uh, interest uh, uh, the flexibility and the pragmatic approach that was adopted. Of course, uh, every country, every government in the world has a different country and a different reality. So the, the tolerance of population is different from uh, country to country and from the different, in the different areas of the country. I think that the government has made uh, in a pragmatic and uh, uh, efficient way whatsoever it was possible. And uh, uh, it, it is continuing like that. On the other side, to ensure the, the security, to ensure the, the, the safety of the population. From the other side, to safeguard that minimum economic life, which was absolutely necessary. Thank you, Your Excellency. And would you kindly share your message of hope to the people of Pakistan uh, from the people of Italy? Uh, that's the last question. Hope, uh, hope is guiding every our everyday life. Let's work together to get out of this. Let's make of this crisis an opportunity to have lessons learned to, be, to build a better future. We wish you to overcome this soon. As you have been in Italy in the first days, Italy will be with you in these days and in the future. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. We're very grateful for your time and your attention. Thank you, so much indeed. Thank you so much, Excellency, for your presence. And we are joined by another amazing ambassador, Ambassador of Portugal to Pakistan, His Excellency Mr. Paolo. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, ambassador Paolo has remained serving at different positions, different departments uh, at, uh, in Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Portugal. Uh, and of course, uh, serving in, in Mexico, in Consul General of Newark, in Goa, and permanent representative at the Consul of Europe, and then in Paris. Paris. And then, uh, of course, serving currently serving as Ambassador of Portugal to Pakistan. Welcome, Excellency, and on the occasion, your kind remarks. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I would like to thank, uh, in first place, the Institute of Peace and Diplomatic Studies for this inv invitation. And uh, I would like to start with a few words in Urdu. At least I, I will try to do a short sentence in Urdu. So let's do it. 
So mind Pakistan ki akomat aul awan ko kumi din kai moka aul COVID-19 kai kilaf kamayabi per Mubarak bad data om. I hope it was not too bad. That's brilliant. That is brilliant. Oh, brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, I would like to start to, to congratulating the, the people and the government of Pakistan for the Independence Day. Pakistan is a very young country. Uh, it has a huge potential, uh, a huge talent, and a great youth. So I think uh, if, you, if you are committed, if you are brave, um, uh, Pakistan will be always a, a great country and uh, uh, with a, a very special role, role in the international community. Um, I also would like to congratulate uh, Pakistan for the important success in the fight against COVID-19. Uh, it must be acknowledged that uh, the strategy adopted by the government of Pakistan has been very successful in that it was able to draw a balance between public health and the, the economy. Prime Minister Imran Khan's vision since the beginning of the crisis established, in my point of view, the right framework and pointed in the right uh, direction. Um, the trace tracking and testing system, coupled with the smart lockdowns and the star standard operation procedures implemented by a remarkable institutional setup was the key for success in Pakistan. Um, support uh, to the most vulnerable was not forgotten through the ESAS program and also target support for different sectors that, of the economy, such as construction. So these measures, I think, uh, make feel people that they were not alone uh, with the fighting the, the virus. In this context, we must also pay tribute to the usual resilience and the, the solidarity of the people of Pakistan when confronting difficulties. As the, the UN Secretary General said, the choice between saving lives from COVID-19 and saving the economy is not really a choice because one issue is linked with the other. Both go together. If we don't protect the economy, it will be more difficult to beat the virus. And also, if we don't adopt the necessary public health measures, the economy will suffer for a much longer time. And those people, in particular the most vulnerable, will suffer from unemployment, like lack of livelihoods and the basic needs. Poor people, if not cared for, would ask, why should I be worried with COVID-19 if I'm at risk of dying from anger? That's one of the real questions we, put, we must put. In respect of my country, I think we have been also very successful until now on lowering the numbers of the infected people. All the institutions, the government, political parties, civil society, and the public in general have been working on the same direction and in a very disciplined way. Portuguese people understood immediately that sacrifices would have to be made so the country could overcome the virus with the minimum damage to the economy and to the population. We understand it will take a long time to recover completely. The Portuguese economy relies much on the service sector, in particular tourism, small business and retail, which are sectors very particularly affected by this uh, pandemic. However, in spite of our difficulties, we were not blind to the difficulties of other countries. Uh, in this context, we prepared the debt relief programs with two African countries with which we have very close relationships, namely Cape Verde and Santo Main Prince. And we supported other African countries like Mozambique. 
Uh, we also participate in the European Union initiatives in support of different countries, namely Pakistan. Um, in respect of my work in Pakistan, in the, in the, in the, the priorities, I would like to say that I firmly believe that people-to-people -people contacts and in particular exchange of students is one of the better ways to prom promote bilateral relations and the friendship between countries. One of my priorities is the promotion of my country as a destination for international study students. And I would like to see more Pakistanis studying in Portugal. We have very good universities. We have the perfect environment for the students to develop their potential. A new academic year is about to start in Portugal in September, October, and we must do our best to, so that international students are not affected by the current difficulties, which I think it's a major concern for, for many countries. Also, as the Pakistani community in Portugal is growing in numbers, we are committed to respect the right of Pakistani people living in Portugal to reunite with their families. And the pandemic must not be an obstacle to that effect. Otherwise, there are many other avenues of cooperation that uh, I have yet to, ex to, to explore since I just I arrived one year ago in Pakistan and now suddenly the, the pandemic came, so the, it's more difficult to work, but um, I, 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 I will explore another news because Pakistan and Portugal have had always a very friendly relationship uh, since the, the, the 50s, so, but we have to explore more the potential um, in our bilateral uh, relations. But um, coming back to the pandemic, I think we must be aware that it is not time yet to be complacent. The pandemic is not over in spite of the good results in our two countries. Um, the pandemic is a global threat that must be faced globally. Uh, unfortunately, it is not being faced with the same seriousness by all countries but we must be responsible. We must be cautious because as everyone knows, the, the virus spreads very easily and there are different countries in which we have seen resurgence in the number of cases when we try to, to ease the restriction measures. According to scientific data, a so-called second wave is expected in, in winter and the, maybe things can get, get worse, we, we must be prepared. And in, because in the end, only the vaccine will be the, the real game changer. And when the vac vaccine is created, we must be sure that it will be available to everyone and it will be free of cost. That should be a global principle. What lessons should be learned from this crisis? I think we should see through this situation. We should rethink our development models. We should make a better use of the resources of the planet, which are limited. We must invest in the renewable energies. We should build a more equi equitable world with more solidarity, a greener world. Countries should comply with the sustainable development goals. Limit CO2 emissions and meet the, goal, the goals of the Paris Agreement. But according to United Nations, we are lagging behind in, this, in these goals. The outcome document of the Rio Plus 20 conference underscores climate change as an inevitable and urgent global challenge with long-term implications for the sustainable development of all countries. Of course, at first sight, we could think that the pandemic has no relation with the climate change, but it is not correct, it is wrong. Like the pandemic, climate change is a public health issue. Our way of life is an enabler of this kind of phenomenon, as the scientists know. The pandemic and climate change 
are part of a very quick systemic changes that are taking place in our ecosystems and which are inter interdependent. So our responses must be holistic. Our responses to this crisis must take into account all different dimensions. We like, in, in, in first place, health system resilience, which have to take into account food security, water security, global warming, women empowerment, education, human rights, so that we are duly prepared to face any challenge that risks our well-being and that of our future generations. This is, a, this is not a challenge, this is not a crisis isolated. This is a global issues that we have to face. International relations should be underpinned by multilateralism, social justice, international cooperation, global peace, healthcare should be enhanced and made available for all. For all. Governments must not forget the social contract to which they are bound. Every country and every citizen must understand that what it does affects the others and that there is a multiplier effect of any local measure or individual action on the global scale, be it positive or negative. Finally, we must be pragmatic and realistic. For example, we should more work more at home, going to office maybe three, three days a week, so our cities are not jammed with the heavy traffic at fresh hours, which is a major source of CO2. We need more greener, greener cities and an environment healthier for, for our mind and for our bodies. We must change our lifestyle. The resources must be shared with more equity. Technology, the internet should be available to everyone so it can be used to save energy and to enhance our human development. Pakistan, Zinawar. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much. I am deeply touched. I'm sure everyone else uh, must also be deeply touched uh, with your speaking skills, particularly in Urdu language. You spoke in our <laughs> national language, and this was amazing. And That's I must say, your Urdu is fabulous. I have. Don't say that. Don't say that. <laughs> I, I learned a little bit with my wife. A little bit with my wife. She's, she's my teacher. She's learning, so she's my teacher. <laughs> excellent, excellent. So, uh, can we have regards to her as well? Uh, I have two very quick questions. The first question is a bit of a personal. Do you, wh what specific Pakistani cuisine you and your wife liked about Pakistan? Would you like to comment on that? And my second question is uh, that uh, in face of this Corona crisis, uh, many countries are investing time, energy, resources in, in creating some vaccine against this coronavirus. And I'm a psychologist when I studied uh, in positive psychology and re research has repeatedly proved that the people who are more optimistic, they catch less infectious diseases. So what do you think the world global leaders should be doing to spread more hope and positivity around the globe? What's your view on that? The first question, you go first to the first question. We, we are enjoying... <laughs> We are enjoying very much Pakistan. Uh, we live here, I have a seven year old uh, boy. And uh, so we enjoy the, the, the food. We enjoy, we have, we, as long as we could, we, we traveled to Karachi, we traveled to Lahore, it's a fantastic city. We traveled to Swat. Uh, um, I myself went to Peshawar and uh, I was in the bazaar. I visited the bazaar. It's a very, lively city. We were scheduled to go to the northern areas, but then the COVID came and um, it was not possible. We, uh, we interact very well with Pakistani people. Everyone is very emotional. Everyone is very, very friendly. The Islamabad is a fantastic city, very green, not with too much traffic. <laughs> so we can go from everywhere very easily. So we feel comfortable and we expect to be uh, for some few years. And we expect this, this virus to go away, <laughs> okay. like everyone. Um, um, 
the other the other issue was more uh, about okay so what world leaders should do so of course the 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 research to find the vaccine is very very important as as, as everyone can recognize because once we have the vaccine if it is a reliable vaccine because as the, as the scientists say it takes time to have a reliable vaccine so this will be a game changer and in that moment we hope the the world leaders and the get together so that the, uh, the vaccine can be distributed in first place to the people more vulnerable and then in different stages to the ones that need it and should be free of course that's i think something that everyone should be able to um, in general in psychological terms I, I perfectly agree that if you are a happy person if you have a positive uh, attitude uh, that your immune system uh, is more prepared to, to fight disease and uh, you are a person more lively so every i imagine i'm not a scientist or a doctor so i imagine that you are more able to fight uh, anything negative that comes comes to you um, in terms of our world leaders they should speak more with each other we should not, uh, we are confronting too much. We are really confronting too much. Mm -hmm. And the people uh, should understand the point of view of the others. Of course, in international relations, it, this has been going on for thousands of years. We have no, there are no friends in international relations. Mm -hmm. There are interests. So every country uh, uh, fights for its interests. So, but, uh, Maybe we should reach the point and in which we 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 understand that the other the, the, the interests of the others are also our, other our interests. So we should see the inter, uh, the interests not in a selfish way, but uh, as common interests of the of the humankind and uh, of our societies and uh, of our well-being. Um, unfortunately. The United Nations, which is uh, it was created uh, after the, sec in the Second World War, uh, but sh should have more power. But it's not po it, for the moment. It's still not possible. But uh, I think um, uh, it will be very important to empower the United Nations as a global body and uh, for the countries to respect what is decided at, uh, at uh, that level and to implement the, the, the international law, because there is the international law. There are many laws, many, many regulations, so, but they need to be implemented. That's, uh, thank, that's, thank, you, that's thank you, Excellency. Thank you, brilliant <laughs> Excellency. Your message of hope on the 73rd Independence Day of Pakistan for the people of Pakistan. So, uh, I would like to say to the people of Pakistan that uh, we have you must be strong, we must be creative, we must uh, have imagination, we, we, we must be positive and uh, everything uh, becomes better. You have a great country with a great resource, beautiful, with a uh, great culture, a great language. So you, you have everything to, 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 to continue to be uh, uh, an important country and uh, I hope you don't lose your emotional, emotional, your love for each other, your solidarity, your sense of uh, friendship and of belonging and uh, helping the, the family, the extended family, the friends, everything. That's, that's uh, what makes our lives better and uh, more positive. Thank you, Thank you so much, you. Excellency. This was... Sorry, I, I lost the sound. I lost it. Thank you so much, Excellency, for your kind presence. And uh, this was Ambassador of Portugal to Pakistan. Thank you so much for your message of hope and togetherness for people of Pakistan. We have been joined by uh, Excellency High Commissioner of Sri Lanka to Pakistan, who is Vice Admiral uh, Mohan Vijit Kirma. Um, uh, Excellency Ambassador, uh, High Commissioner of Sri Lanka has 
has recently arrived in June in Pakistan and having a career in for 34 years in Sri Lankan Navy and retired in 2005 and remained as in different positions. Uh, he's an alumni and staff course, uh, has done the staff course um, at the Naval War College at Rose Island in USA, uh, National Defense College in New Delhi, India, and of course, Pacific Asia Special Operation Conference in Hawaii. Um, he was awarded several medals from the government of uh, Sri Lanka for his outstanding career and uh, presence uh, serving at important positions. He is currently our High Commissioner of Sri Lanka in Pakistan. Welcome, Excellency, for your kind presence and patience. Um, you had remained there for, for quite long. Um, Excellency, uh, Vice Admiral Mohan, can you hear us? Yes, thank you very much. Thank Good evening. Thank you. Thank you so much and welcome to Pakistan. Your remarks, please. Thank you very much. First of all, let me thank you for inviting me for this uh, great initiative uh, by uh, the, the Institute of Peace and Strategical Studies. At the outset, let me greet and send uh, the best wishes on behalf of the government and the people of Democratic uh, Socialist, so, Socialist Republic of Sri Lanka to the government and the people of the Islamic Republic of Pakistan on your Independence Day. Uh, if you look at, if you turn the clock around a little, I think uh, the time we uh, attained independence in 1948, our founding father of Sri Lanka at that time known as Ceylon, Honorable D.S. Sinanayaka traveled to Pakistan to meet the founding father of Pakistan, Honorable Muhammad Ali Jinnah. That solid diplomatic foundation laid 72 years back still stands rock hard embedded in the minds of our people. Since then, all the governments that were in power had maintained the high level of political, social, and cultural relationship between the two nations. On the economic, economic front, uh, Pakistan signed a free trade agreement with Sri Lanka. That was your first free trade agreement. And uh, we have, uh, without tariff, we can trade roughly about 4,000 items between the two countries. But I must say that you know we have not been really exploiting this trade agreement to the maximum, and there's a lot of room for us to improve. There are again people to people contact uh, Sri Lanka and Pakistan in the same subcontinent, and uh, during my stay, I hope to see that we get more outbound Pakistanis to Sri Lanka. At the same time, we have nice places for Buddhist tourists to come and visit in Pakistan, so that there'll be exchange of tourists from both countries, so that we come to know each other much closer. Pakistan has been a, a great friend of ours who had assisted us uh, continuously. I mean, uh, they have been training our security forces and providing what, whenever we needed much needed security assistance in the form of military hardware during the time we were, you know, ravaged by a conflict uh, uh, with terrorism. Of course, cricket, we both have complimented each other. We are, you know, during the uh, difficult times in 1996 during the World Cup, we all came and showed that Sri Lanka is safe for cricket. And we also have come there in return in last year, I think, and played some matches with you so that we gave the message that Pakistan is safe for cricket. Right, now we'll get into the main theme of this Congress. I think we are just talking about the surviving Corona coming out stronger today. In Sri Lanka, the first corona case was detected on the 27th of January. Of course, a Chinese lady returning after a holiday was detected at the airport and were retained and treated. And then after 23 days, she went back. Then the second case was very much later. That was on the 1st of March uh, this year. But during that time, uh, Sri Lanka established a presidential task force between this period uh, chaired by the president of the country, fully realizing the danger that it can pose to a small country like ours with a small economy, limited ICU facilities, ventilators, if it was, if it was allowed to spread. This arrangement suited well uh, in forecasting the health and other needs uh, and transmitting policy decisions to the ministries, departments and agencies tasked in controlling the, and treating the pandemic. An all island uh, lockdown obviously had to take place uh, somewhere on the 20th of March, bringing all activity to a halt 
because we noticed that uh, all of a sudden that there was a spread of virus because of the returning uh, Sri Lankans uh, from uh, other countries. During the lockdown period, uh, we managed to uh, trace the, uh, I mean, the patients, the, I mean, people who had con uh, contacted the virus. Not only them, we managed to trace their contacts and within a short period, we got them onto, I mean, quarantine centers. Country established 70 large quarantine centers, and we had at one time close upon to about six, 7,000 people in these quarantine centers. And we managed to contain it without allowing it to spread to the community. Now, uh, the number of hospitals, we had only one to treat uh, the COVID uh, patients in March, but we developed uh, with assistance from other countries, even Pakistan has assisted us to build seven uh, hospitals to treat uh, the COVID patients. As of today, we have, uh, we have had only 2,888 corona cases in the country and only 231 are remaining active and we had 11 deaths. However, the lockdown severely uh, impacted the economy. The hospitality uh, sector, what is uh, one of our main uh, revenue uh, earners, uh, which uh, employ about half a million persons directly and indirectly, and the informal sector was burst affected. Then the foreign orders to our garment sector, which is Sri Lanka also has a relatively high level of garment exports. Uh, I mean, uh, we also make uh, garments in Sri Lanka and export it to UN, US. That was uh, most of the orders got canceled. Then our remittances from the expatriate workers fell considerably. Government also recognizing the vulnerability of households to the economic fallout, committed about 50 billion, that is close upon to about US dollars, 120 <clears throat> million. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Yes, we can hear you. We, are, we can hear you very well. So, so about 270 million was, uh, was a monthly grant of 5,000 each for about 7.5 million people during this April and May when the country was locked down. Central Bank of Sri Lanka has supported uh, the affected companies in the form of 150 basis points in monetary easing since start of the 200, 2020 with suspension of loan payments for a stipulated period and concessionary refinancing program of 50 billion for activities affected by the pandemic. That is mostly the uh, hospitality sector. Sri Lanka became the first country in South Asia to hold parliamentary elections under COVID-19 uh, about a week back of this month. And 70% uh, of the registered voters exercised their franchise because we were, we had the SOPs, but uh, we not, did not have uh, the virus in the community. And of course, the result uh, clearly uh, shows that uh, the people were satisfied with uh, the way government has handled the COVID-19 uh, in the country. Our university schools are opening and we are looking at the tourist trade to recommence it. I know that Pakistan itself has opened the airports and we are looking at uh, even getting the Pakistan tourists the high end to our country in uh, group, pack group uh, packages. And we have been also declared by the World uh, Travel Council as one of the safest, uh, we, are, we have got the safe to travel uh, stamp for safety protocols. Now, I would just say that uh, what would be the post-COVID world? I mean, uh, there are a lot of discussions in this forum, but I'm not sure that uh, whether we have come to terms with post-COVID. It is increasingly becoming clear that the post-COVID-19 world will be different from what the humankind has been used to for centuries. Status of economy, social order will undergo obvious change. While some countries will gain some will experience intolerable losses depending on how each country handled the pandemic. The social landscape has already changed in both developed and developing world. Most people will not fully grasp the scale, of scale, the scope, the pace of the impact on their individual lives. Or the large amount of spent on research, so far we have not got a vaccine, a proper vaccine there have been certainly vaccines being produced, 
but uh, I wish that we get a vaccine as fast as possible, but uh, still we do not have a confirmed vaccine which will treat the virus and we don't have a 100% cure. And it is bound to take uh, a long time before it reaches the poorest societies. If we, if we find a vaccine, even the poorest societies will take a long time and uh, it all depends on the finances of the societies. Even after mass vaccination, many people will avoid public interaction or travel. Hospitality at the air travel, worsted by the pandemic, will suffer more in the days to come until people, public confidence and trust is fully restored. Non-formal sector that will worst it during the lockdown will take long time to fully recover. Unemployment will accelerate the vicious circle of poverty. Unless the developed world stand together with the developing nations and help in reviving the global economy with debt relief and generous economic assistance, the global poverty situation will further activate during the and after COVID-19. SOP such as face masks, social distancing and hand sanitizing has come to stay for a little while. We have seen how Pakistan has worked its own strategy in dealing with COVID-19. And I must say, and must congratulate that the smart lockdown in Pakistan has worked. Similarly, each country will deal depending on its internal and external factors unique to each country. No country is going to be judged by the number of COVID deaths it has had, but how it has come strong economically after, pandemic, after the pandemic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Your Excellency. Um, you rightly pointed out to the deep uh, military and strategic relationships between the two countries. And, and as we say that a friend in need is a friend indeed, the Pakistan and Sri Lanka both have been proving for each other a friend in need. Um, before I proceed, and actually uh, as we are now wrapping it up, uh, I wouldn't forget uh, inviting one of our honorable panelists who ran one of the biggest campaign in the country um, for his comments and question and interaction and conclude interaction with you. I'll be inviting um, exact, the executive director of Akhuvat, Dr. Muhammad Amjad Saqib. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Arif Saab. And uh, let me first appreciate the wonderful you know, talk given by His Excellency, the ambassador from Sri Lanka. So he uh, very comprehensively covered the uh, you know, relationship between Pakistan and Sri Lanka and what happened in Pakistan, his general advice. And uh, I especially liked his last comments that uh, the strength of a nation will not be measured by the deaths. It will be measured by the economic uh, you know, condition post uh, COVID. Because uh, um, nations should be measured by the life, uh, by the vibrancy, by the you know, great struggle and the impact and the outcome, how the nations uh, uh, rise after falling. So uh, this is a message for me, it's a mess great message of hope that we should continue to struggle, we should continue to work hard and we should continue to make every possible endeavor to take our people out of poverty, but because that is economic development, that is social development, that is prosperity, and that is ultimately peace, because uh, all these things will ultimately lead to a better world, a peaceful world. So thank you very much, His Excellency, for your kind words about Pakistan and encouraging us and showing us the right way forward. Uh, that was a great listening view. I have been to Sri Lanka and I found uh, Sri Lanka much cleaner than Pakistan. Uh, I don't know, this is because of the better literacy rate or something else, but uh, we have to learn a lot from you because in uh, subcontinent in South Asia, uh, obviously uh, Sri Lanka is a role model in terms of uh, education and, and the health indicators. So uh, I went there to talk on a microfinance conference. So I will be happy to share what we do in microfinance and poverty alleviation, what a whole envisions to contribute for a better world. So we will be happy to, you know, uh, give you more uh, information about our, uh, our vision of uh, good and prosperous life. 
So, Arif Sahib, if you allow me to give me general comments about the old days, or uh, should I hold um, So, we, uh, we can, we can uh, yeah, just wait. Yes. We will just, we we'll do, do this actually, two, yeah, two more ambassadors to go after having the final comments from yes, uh, His we Excellency. Yes, two more guests. Yes. Okay. So, so then we definitely were waiting for your comments and uh, please yes. do stay with us till then. Thank you very much. Yeah. Your Excellency, Thank you very message much. of hope. Yes. Th your Thank you very much. Uh, I, I must say that, you know, uh, this is the first visit to Pakistan, but I am uh, flabbergasted uh, of the beauty of Islamabad. You know, uh, when you say that you are complimenting Kalambu, but Islamabad is a beautiful city and uh, beautiful people, very well planned. It's clean, all right, but there's a lot of construction going on. And I'm sure in another a few years' time, it will be matching any other European cities. My hope, uh, you know, Pakistan has been a great nation. It has a history and a heritage, civilization, comes from centuries. And uh, it's a resilient uh, population. I mean, they always bounce back. So uh, like all us, we are all suffering from this COVID, not only Pakistan, and we all must bounce back together. And uh, I'm sure that uh, you will, uh, as you have been, play a major role in the region and in the world uh, for stability and for development. And uh, I wish the Pakistan people and the government the very best on the Independence Day. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was His Excellency, High Commissioner of Sri Lanka to Pakistan. Welcome to Pakistan again. You were here in June, but I hope that your stay here in Pakistan will continue. And of course, uh, you know, uh, a wonderful stay uh, in, in the country. Um, our our, our uh, uh, next guest uh, His Excellency Mohammad Mohtar, who is the ambassador of Yemen to Pakistan and served as, uh, you know, serving not only Pakistan, but also uh, looking after the operations uh, to Kazakhstan, Maldives and Afghanistan. And of course, over the time period, he has been serving as Charge Affairs Embassy of Yemen in Malaysia from 2013 and 16, and later serving at different positions in, 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 the, in the head office and later in different parts of the world, including Australia, uh, including Tehran, and uh, later uh, in Mumbai as well, and different places across the world. So Excellency Ambassador has also remained in Pakistan for a few years as well. Ambassador Amata, this is, this is your your turn and thank you so much for your presence and your kindness always supporting us and our initiatives um, and the love of Yemen has remained closer to my heart because of uh, Tawakkul, Tawakkul Karman who has remained uh, you know a uh, Nobel Peace Laureate in the, in the world. Thank you so much Excellency for for sharing the message of hope and the panel here today. Thank you so much. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Can you hear me? Yes. yes we can hear. Yeah, well, uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum, Jamian. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, well, it's a pleasure of mine to, uh, to be in the program. And of course, I came late. I did not, um, I haven't uh, heard the previous speakers because I have uh, other engagements, so I'm so sorry. But in general, I understood that this general program, which it is, talk about the relations between Pakistan and other countries, as well as the hope or the look out of the, uh, the diplomat towards Pakistan. Well, uh, first of all, I, it gives me pleasure to congratulate Pakistan, the great people of Pakistan, its leadership, and uh, of the uh, its Independence Day, which is a great day, we understand, of Pakistan uh, as a Muslim ummah. Uh, and also, we, we do, I would like to congratulate Pakistan on overcoming approximately the COVID-19 till now with the smart lockdown, which is uh, comparable with its large number of people. It is uh, the damage from COVID. It is uh, 19. It is uh, little comparable to many countries. And uh, we were here actually. Uh, Alhamdulillah, things has went uh, good. And we hope that these things in the future, in the coming months or so, will, will go good. And uh, I wish the safety for our brothers and sisters in Pakistan. Personally, because I served twice in Pakistan, I love Pakistan in general. So Pakistan's in the bad, first of all. And Jashni uh, Azadi Mubarak for Pakistan. Uh, this is uh, my greetings to you and to everybody there. 
uh, our relation, of course, Pakistan, Yemeni relation is a strong relation, cordial. Of course, there's no much interest because the, the, uh, the two countries have difficulties in exports, maybe in the same, maybe we have the similar, uh, what you call it, commodities. And uh, we also, uh, we in Yemen, we have in the few years, we have conflict, unfortunately, which it is damaging the interests of Yemen with the, all countries, including Pakistan. But still, there are some uh, fields which we are, we are still, I mean, it's a functioning or doing good, like the education. Uh, we have around uh, 400 students here are studying a different discipline, which it is um, a remarkable number and good number, but of course not comparable with the previous number that is in the 80s, Yemenis were with thousands, they were studying them I mean, in, 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 in thousands. Uh, of his students, and uh, we have a lot of um, a lot of officials who were graduated from Pakistan, doctors, lawyers, and accountants, and uh, we had also a lot of Pakistanis who served in Yemen as a bankers, and I, re I recall uh, uh, and mention His Excellency Mohammed Yan Simru was a, a big banker in Yemen. He was general director for one of the banks, so we have. Um, Many, uh, many officials, that is a, a Pakistani who served in, in different fields in Yemen. So the, this is um, just a little uh, picture about the relations between the two countries. Of course, we enjoy our brotherly countries. We have approximately, we say, our semi border that is between us, the Arabic Sea. So we are very close, we have proximity. Uh, we have similarities in geography, actually, and maybe in the demography itself. Uh, that is, we have uh, the composition of the society. Uh, of course, there is no comparable between Pakistan and Yemen in the, its large scale of uh, potential for ge uh, geography. It's, uh, since it's stretched from the south to the north and have all potentials for, uh, for tourism and for agriculture and uh, for endeavors, uh, adventures. Uh, so, uh, by all means and ways, uh, there are a lot of potentials, but unfortunately for these circumstances, still we are lacking behind. We, we couldn't overcome it, even we are trying to do, do so. Uh, Pakistan is a great country for us. It's a Muslim, it's a great Muslim country, and it has, it wins the heart and minds of the Muslim, particularly in Yemen. So you mentioned Pakistani women, it is something different, I mean, different test. Maybe you have, maybe the, we have the communalities which it is bonds us together. Uh, that is, of course, it is a basis for the, uh, for a, uh, a good cooperation and building interest in the future. Uh, inshallah, we will overcome the obstacles which we face it, whether it is, uh, whether it is because the, the inability to to, um, to, to produce and uh, export a large scale and to compete. Now it's the, everywhere, it's the market's open everywhere. Uh, Pakistan exporting this moment uh, rice, uh, products of the leather. It produces uh, some uh, medicines and well, that is med pharmaceutical products. And uh, just, uh, but it's, uh, personally, as a Yemeni, as an ambassador, I'm not satisfied at all. I want to see all the products of Pakistan in Yemen and versa versa. So uh, this is my impression, personal, and this from my bottom of my heart, uh, because we, we bear uh, a good uh, respect, gratitude, and uh, love to Pakistan and its people. From my own experience here, I live like I'm living at home, really. I'm not courtesying you or giving you just because I'm in the show. No, I'm not at all. It is my, uh, I used to go anywhere. It is, of course, I toured Pakistan while I was uh, DHM that time in 2005, approximately, for the earthquake, unfortunately. But uh, I know most of the part of Pakistan. Uh, and of course, it is uh, a lovely place to visit. Pakistani people also to meet Pakistani people. They are very hospitable people and easy to go with, penetrate, uh, and easy to penetrate into society. 
So for me, with my color, maybe. And with color, still give me this chance <laughs> to, uh, to go you everywhere. Can. Yeah. The, so, uh, alhamdulillah, uh, we, uh, we invite you for this kind of, what you call it, uh, ethics, which is hospitality and uh, uh, this kind of gesture toward others. Uh, there are a lot of, as mentioned, a lot of potentials for Pakistan to sell its products brand outside, especially in the Arab countries. But uh, in general, uh, term is still, is still uh, far of doing, I mean, of having that. Uh, still, I mean, uh, if you compare the total uh, uh, the balance of payment like Yemen and Pakistan, it's very meager and it's, uh, it's not satisfactory at all. Uh, we wish that is one day to say uh, it's in different uh, uh, level. Uh, Pakistan, uh, with its mega and strategic project, uh, projects, I, 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 hope, I hope and I'm very optimistic that you to see it after maybe less than 10 years is different. Very developed and prosperous country. And of course, it's have uh, from, I mean, the potential of growing uh, as a developing country, it is there. And uh, I think there is potential to see it, uh, as I mentioned. Uh, Pakistan also is, and Yemen share a lot of uh, political uh, understanding and stance our many issues. Uh, because Pakistan and Yemen are peace-loving countries, and we are working in this. We are cooperating uh, internationally. We have mutual understanding toward the Islamic Ummah issues and uh, uh, toward the also uh, mean the uh, human issues. Uh, I wish that this Pakistan uh, will be uh, more stronger, further developed in the future and have a uh, high say in the international politics. Thank you so much, Excellency Mata, for, for your wonderful remarks. Your message of hope to the people of Pakistan, specifically when, when we are facing a lot of big challenges and the country, Yemeni people facing a lot of challenges, but they're coming out stronger. And your message of hope as a master of Yemen to Pakistan, for people of Pakistan on this occasion. So you want my 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 message? Your message well, of hope for the people of Pakistan. Well, I think as I mentioned that this Pakistan has a lot of potentials, whether it is in geographical perspective, whether it is in the uh, you see uh, the demographic uh, demographic uh, perspective. Around 65 of the people of Pakistan are young. This is another potential, and uh, it's not discovered yet. A lot of uh, minerals and uh, a lot of projects. It is, uh, it is uh, what you call it, uh, hopeful, and uh, it, uh, just it, it's, it wants digging, digging it out. Out. So uh, Pakistan, we should. I mean, uh, it is the interest of every Pakistani to support the institutions in general and to support the security of Pakistan, to support its uh, few, uh, this is optimistic future lock. And uh, it is one of the, of course, uh, encourageable uh, aspect that is democracy is running now smoothly and changing is taking place smoothly. And that is, I mean, something good and the, the, for the politics uh, wise. For the economics, I think Tebek, you have big projects. You have mega projects. You have also very strong projects which is affiliated to this project. I think Pakistan is, is hitting well, if, despite all the challenges. It needs to be more united. And uh, there is interest for everybody in Pakistan, I think. Brilliant, Excellency. Thank you so much for your kind presence, your message of hope uh, for people of Pakistan. And I'm, I'm sure that this message of hope will create a lot of a lot of togetherness, a lot of uh, support with all the people, not only in Pakistan, but also in Yemen. Um, we are joined by um, 
Mr. Shah Nasir, who is, who is looking after, who is head of the regional uh, coordinator office of the United Nations, resident coordinator office of the United Nations. Shah Nasir has, uh, has more than 15 years of experience in strategic planning, research and development in policy. And he is looking after um, uh, you know, this, this office. Um, and prior to that, he has been remain, uh, looking after the policy and STD unit in the UN World Food Program. And he has also served as head of the Relief Innovations Unit in WFP. He served as uh, advisor to provincial government in KP and housing uh, compensations, of course, in Malakan. And as a result of this militancy and floods, um, he's, uh, he's a visit visiting faculty in the Military College of Engineering in NUST, UET Peshawar, and Civil Services Academy, um, with, uh, with, and having a background of civil engineering in earthquake engineering and disaster risk management. Uh, including his, his own profile of having the political science expertise. Shah Nasir, um, your message for on behalf of the United Nations uh, on the case. Inlai Rahman Rahim. Um, thank you very much, Farhat. Um, good afternoon and assalamu alaikum, everyone. Um, I want to start, start by thanking the Institute of Peace and Development Studies um, and uh, also Akhuat for organizing the Hopathon Ambassador Congress. And I uh, feel honored to be on the same forum as Dr. Ramjit Saqib, for which a lot of people look at with a lot of hopes. And um, he has been an inspiration for many in Pakistan and beyond. So on behalf of United Nations in Pakistan and the UN resident and humanitarian coordinator, um, I congratulate all Pakistanis on 74th year of the country's independence. As we gather today, uh, the world is experiencing deepening crisis. Uh, COVID-19 is, uh, as you all know, more than a health crisis. It is a human crisis, uh, an economic crisis, uh, a social crisis, and a developmental crisis. Uh, it is affecting everyone everywhere, and no region and no country um, is spared. The UN commends the way the government of Pakistan and the people of Pakistan have risen to the challenge to fighting the COVID. Uh, since the pandemic began, the UN has stood with our member states to turn the tide of this global emergency. In Pakistan, we are on the front line. Uh, we coordinating tirelessly with our uh, government partners, donors, the civil society, the media, and the private sector, so that we can all come together to beat this pandemic. Uh, from the very beginning, um, we have been mobilizing resources uh, to support the government's response a global partner platform by World Health Organization is helping to track the funding, monitor the progress, uh, and monitor and manage the resources, standardize the health actions, and procure medical supplies. So far, if you look at the, 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 the forum, 21 donors have registered, delivering a total contribution of around $1.17 billion. Uh, this includes uh, $540 million for the COVID Pakistan Preparedness and Response Plan, and a US dollar 1.55 billion for the UN socioeconomic response plan. The UN has three immediate priorities uh, to end the COVID pandemic, uh, to address its socioeconomic impacts, and to recover better uh, so that no one is left behind. First, with our immediate uh, WHO led health response, we are working to suppress the transmission of the virus. Directed by the UN resident coordinator, UN agencies are assisting country level coordination, planning and monitoring for a more effective response. We are using risk communication and community engagement to raise awareness of how to stay safe. We are battling the tide of COVID-19 misinformation by increasing the volume and reach of trusted accurate information nationwide. Our support for better surveillance, case identification and laboratories is helping to pinpoint COVID cases and get them the health care they need. Screening and capacity strengthening at the points of entry is from providing personal prote protective equipment to building water, sanitation, and hygiene facilities um, and delivering training so that workers on the front line and behind the scenes can take a little pandemic heads on. Second, our humanitarian response is addressing the humanitarian impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the most vulnerable, uh, from Afghan refugees to marginalized Pakistani communities. Uh, third, our socioeconomic response is confronting the human crisis, uh, the crisis that COVID has at the core of Pakistan society and economy. 
this socio-economic response is guide, guided by the five pillars um, of the UN COVID-19 Pakistan socio-economic framework. Our first priority is health. As we focus on the immediate health response to COVID, we are making sure that the health system continues to deliver quality essential services for all. With our second pillar, we are prioritizing social protection and basic services. This is about protecting um, people in every respect from food security and nutrition to education uh, and learning and providing services to, for survivors of gender-based violence. Our third pillar is economic recovery. So we are giving um, pride of place to Pakistan's most at-risk workers, including daily wage, laborers, women, transgenders, person and vulnerable groups. Through research and policy dialogue, we are promoting our fourth pillar, the multilateral collaboration and microeconomic response. And with our fifth pillar, we are advancing social cohesion and community resilience by sensitizing the public and engaging immense potential of Pakistan's youth. Our efforts uh, are made possible with the generous support of our donors and partners. And I must thank all of them, and uh, which includes the Bell and Melinda Gates Foundation, the European Union, uh, JICA, the U UK Department of International Development, and the government of Australia, Canada, the Czech Republic, Germany, Japan, Norway, the Netherlands, South Korea, Sweden, and the United States of America. And the list goes on. Um, ladies and gentlemen, the COVID is not just a test of our health system. It is a test of our ability to work together to defeat this common challenge. This pandemic has made one thing very clear. No one is safe until everyone is safe. And we must ensure that an effective response to COVID reaches everyone, everywhere. This means that our response needs to focus on the central pledge of the Sustainable Development Goals to leave no one behind and to reach those farthest behind. This is our best option to save lives, protect people and recover better. It is our only option to build more equal, inclusive and resilient Pakistan that can withstand future crises and turn the tide of COVID for now. We can only come out of the pandemic stronger if we come out of it together and leave no one behind. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Shah Nasir, for the brilliant uh, you know, message of hope from the United Nations. Arif, Anissa. Oh, thank you so much indeed. Uh, what a brilliant day. Like we, we started at 2 p.m. and in four hours, we reached the culmination of uh, this amazing uh, Congress of Hope, Obathan Congress of Hope, Ambassadors Congress. And there have been phenomenal support from the 12 countries uh, which, which were represented by the respective high commissioners and ambassadors. Hope sustains life. Hope implies that there is a possibility of a better future. It shows up at the worst possible time when things are dire bleak and difficult, but can keep us going during these hard moments. If during the difficulty, we can see the faint glimmer of something better, then hope opens us up and then turns us towards something better, something brighter. Hope is not a passive exercise in wishing, but an active approach to life arising when there is something we want when we've got a clear goal in mind. And though it may be tough going, we'll develop a plan to get us closer to where we want to go. When the going gets tough, the tough gets going. These are some of the words I'm, I can come up with while listening to the amazing miseries and envoys from the world's um, great countries, uh, including the United States, the United Kingdom, uh, China, Portugal, uh, Germany, the European Union, all coming in support uh, with Pakistan, all actually um, impressed by the development Pakistan has made. And this is phenomenal because um, in the times of Corona, in these tumultuous, in these tough times, Pakistan emerged as a country with a plan, with a plan for future. And this is something that is the outcome of this Congress. This Congress was never possible until uh, we got the collaboration from our strategic partners. And those strategic partners, uh, they, uh, they are on the panel right now. They have been 
uh, providing us support, they have been providing us uh, leverage. Through them, we achieve uh, today's culmination point that we can say that uh, the Congress of Hope actually took place. Uh, without your support, it would never happen. And to, to wrap up, to actually share your, your, your passion and your the sentiments, uh, what inspired you to become part of it and how you uh, led this amazing activity on the 74th day of independence. I'll be inviting uh, our, um, our inspirational guest, in fact, um, uh, our hero of uh, uh, the, these tough times. Uh, and as a whole emerges, one of the largest organization that um, deals with millions of uh, uh, donors and at the same time, the recipients. During these tough times, uh, I'll be inviting Dr. Amir Sakib to wrap up and then uh, respectively uh, Farah Asif and Kasser Abbas. Dr. Sub, floor is yours. You are full of energy, enthusiasm, and you know. Dr. Sabi is muted. Uh, we cannot hear you. Yeah, now it's better. Is it now? Yeah, okay. So let me repeat what I was saying. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Arif Saab, for such a wonderful session as a marathon. You are always full of energy and enthusiasm and passion, and uh, along with we found uh, great uh, support from Farhad, Kaisa, so all these strategic partners which we have, they have been, you know, so brilliant. So it was a great show in the sense that uh, uh, almost all great nations, countries were represented right from United States to, you know, Canada and, uh, and then uh, UK and then China and then Japan and then European Union and then Portugal, and Germany, and Italy, and uh, uh, Indonesia, then Sri Lanka, then Yemen, so all continents represented. And in the end, you know, it was uh, uh, the best, uh, uh, you know, uh, exposition by Mr. Uh, Shah Nasser. Uh, uh, very beautifully, he, you know, narrated, and almost the summary was given by him. You know, I was amazed by the, you know, uh, same kind of feelings. Uh, in the beginning, the ambassador from the United States said that we, after the corona, we need each other more. That was the first speech. And in the last speech, uh, Mr. Shah Nasser said that uh, no one is safe until everyone is safe. So you can see the similarity of thought and how this uh, COVID, uh, you know, has impacted the whole world and, uh, you know, uh, uh, converted the world into a one single uh, village where we feel for each other, we feel solidarity, we feel uh, compassion, and we like to serve, like to help, and like to uh, take care of those people who have been badly affected by this corona. So that is a great uh, you know, a feeling that we are on the same page and thinking for the betterment of humanity and thinking to create a world which has, uh, you know, possibilities and opportunities for everybody. So this is the best part, the congratulations to all the honorable ambassadors who represented their nations and uh, offered assistance to Pakistan. They appreciated Pakistani nation, its culture, its civilization, its history, then its cuisine. You know, I was intrigued by the questions repeatedly asked by uh, <laughs> Arif that what do you like in Pakistani cuisine. So that shows, you know, how uh, uh, the friendly they are and how deeply immersed they are in local customs, culture, and food and things. And uh, they appreciated Pakistani's hospitality, their resilience, their ability to come, you know, uh, forward in the, on, uh, in the hour of crisis and uh, uh, how, you know, effectively the government of Pakistan has managed this great crisis and then how different organizations, international organizations, local organizations, and civil society has complemented these uh, efforts by you know, uh, government of Pakistan and respective pro uh, provinces. So it was great uh, listening to all these wonderful people who have you know, scores of uh, uh, years experience to share that how nations are built and how 
uh, you know, uh, we can uh, confront a calamity. So all good things. And uh, then again, I was strengthened that all these things are pointing towards the solidarity, towards the compassion which we stand for in a whole world. Uh, you all know that a Hobart was started 20 years ago just by standing with one woman uh, who was in uh, great trouble and uh, her father, uh, uh, sorry, her, her husband passed away and he didn't want to beg. So we uh, embraced her and uh, shown a sense of solidarity by offering a loan of 10,000 rupees and that has now turned out to be the biggest interest-free Islamic microfinance program in the world. We have served more than 4 million. So all those uh, beautiful words and all the speeches and the messages uh, were reinforcing my faith in humanity and uh, you know, power of uh, being together. And especially Farhat was very you know, keen to um, ask the uh, guest uh, to give a message of hope. So that means she is our ambassador of hope. She is our ambassador of optimism. And she wants this hope to be spread around, you know, uh, because uh, life is hope. So without hope, we cannot survive for a single moment. So the belief in one's own self and belief in God and hope and optimism. Nations are, you know, uh, they are not poor because of lack of money. Nations are poor if they lose hope. So hope makes us, you know, vibrant and uh, this is true life. So uh, appreciate Farhat's consistency, uh, consistency in asking that give us hope, give us a good message, take us, you know, uh, uh, out from this uh, despondency. So uh, hope, uh, as I was mentioning, uh, we are also giving hope. We say that we have given loans to four million people, uh, but we don't claim that we have uh, uh, alleviated their poverty. One thing we claim is that we have given them hope. They now feel that they are not alone. They now feel that uh, there is somebody in society who wants to help them, who wants to stand with them. So this inclusiveness which is being you know, brought by Jehovah's message, that is the greatest achievement. If we can, you know, very humbly uh, be proud of, that is this message of hope, solidarity, because the evidence is that uh, 60 to 70 percent of the poor people which have received these loans from us, they have become our donors. So this is, you know, birth of a virtuous cycle. The people who are dependent, the people who are asked most, you know, uh, losing their hope through our, you know, association and love with them and the feeling of brotherhood, they became donors. They became, you know, they came forward and wanted to help somebody else. So in the back uh, 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 ground of Corona, this message of hope, this hope of thorn is extremely, extremely, you know, relevant. So it takes out uh, the best out of us and uh, it is uh, something which inspires us to do even better. Uh, I must congratulate uh, Arif Saab and all our friends. And uh, uh, message from Shah Nasser, I will again repeat, that was a very touching my heart. And I also like, you know, uh, uh, Portugali, Portugal, uh, the ambassador from the Portugal, he was talking beyond Corona, talking about poverty, talking about uh, social cohesiveness, talking about environment, women empowerment. And one more thing, you know, uh, Farhat was uh, slightly partial when she was advocating uh, the leadership for the women. <laughs> we appreciate women leaders, but uh, please think that men are also leaders. So they're also making some change. So that is, uh, again, uh, you know, great uh, uh, idea to you know, uh, put forward. So um, uh, uh, I won't say much, and you know, it, it is not time. It is you know, uh, you are going to end this marathon session. But let me say one thing. So you know, what is uh, in the beginning, Kaiser started with the definition of crisis and uh, definition of uh, you know how one should uh, uh, react in a crisis. So um, let me say one thing about leadership. Leadership is creating an idealized image of yourself. Mm -hmm and then trying 
to resemble it. So we all must create an idealized image of ourselves, of this world. And then we should try to resemble that uh, ideal and then we should try to resemble that ideal for the world. So that's the way where all these great nations, China, America, England, UK, then Japan, Portuguese, Italy, Indonesia, Sri Lanka, Yemen, and the United Nations group. So we can create a better world. Uh, unless we, there is a one person, single person on this globe who is poor, I believe we all are poor. Even if one person in Pakistan is without food and without dignity and without honor, we all are destitute. Poverty is not just, you know, physical uh, uh, deprivation. Poverty is, you know, more than that. So poverty of ideas, poverty of character, and all these things, you know, become poverty. So we must fight with these. I'm a better human being. I'm a more, uh, you know, uh, 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 passionate after listening this, uh, these uh, words of the world. These are the, you know, uh, words of the whole world. And uh, I will take these uh, with me after today's session, share this message with all of my friends, with 7,000 employees and uh, 1 million families who are currently active borrowers of Afobar. So I will take this message and uh, as a true ambassador, uh, will try to share this message with the all around because this is message of hope, love and care. So thank you very much uh, uh, again the whole banner. Interesting. Why, Farad, it's all yours. Oh, thank you, Arif Saab. Um, thank you, Dr. Saqib, for, I mean, for the phenomenal work that you've been doing in Akhwat uh, for so many years, and uh, you had remained my inspiration. Of course, beginning, beginning the work that we've been doing in, in, uh, in, in starting off, but whatever we had achieved so far uh, is because of the hope that uh, we see people like you. Um, and then, of course, uh, Arif Sab, you have asked about uh, why it was important for us to collaborate in such an important manner, such an important forum in creating uh, these kind of, uh, you, know, you know, collaborating to create Hopathon, um, and especially ambassadors. Um, over the time period, we have seen that the nations are distant because of not communicating with each other. One of the reason of bringing all the ambassadors on such forums is to share, not only share their experiences, their uh, you know, perspectives, but also sharing the messages of hope and togetherness uh, uh, in, in such a manner. Uh, they are not only listening to them, you know, uh, they're not listening to others, and of course, listening to Pakistanis who are sharing their experiences as well. Um, I would like to thank, you know, uh, in this entire process, it's not easy to, you know, compile everything that 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 is come in front of you. You know, at the back there is always um, uh, the people who are who are working tirelessly to make these things happen. And I must congratulate Arif Saab uh, for for collaborating and working together. And one unsung hero who could not be here with me, but uh, I would like to share and share that uh, Mr. Asif Noor, who has remained as a brain behind me and sharing uh, the, all the all the all all what I am standing right here is because of him um, supporting me and speaking with all of you like that. And you know. Um, pushing forward uh, everything that we do uh, in, in terms of uh, creating synergies, uh, bringing together um, and connecting people, um, and of course sharing the messages of hope. Uh, uh, over the time periods, we had we had been able to you know take the initiatives. This is this is the public diplomacy uh, initiative, uh, of course, that we had took um, with Akhwat and of course uh, Arif Nisab. Thank you so much for your collaboration for standing by. I think that this is such a wonderful experience that we, we need to do every year um, together with you, with the fourth, so that, you know, we can continue building the relationships, of course, and of course, sharing the messages of hope in terms of, uh, you know, the work that the is doing and the work that we, um, Kassa Saab and Arif Saab, have been doing for for the lot of uh, years. And thank you, Shah Nasisa, for being so patient. I, I, and your message of hope over the, over the you know, overarching, whatever we are doing is, is simply phenomenal. Thank you so much 
for your presence and of course those who had uh, who had um, shared the panel today from different embassies um, representing their work and contribution for the people of Pakistan so um, we always uh, share during the work for the last 15 years we always shared that you know the people who are who are like Dr. Amjad Sakar who are like Kassar Abbas who are like people like myself who are there in 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 the society and that they should connect they should they are representing the true face of Pakistan uh, at not only at the national level but also at the global scale as well so this is a humble contribution uh, specifically on 73rd anniversary of uh, Pakistan's independence Thank you so much, everybody. And of course, uh, I would like to thank a fourth uh, administration. Uh, of course, those people who are looking after this uh, entire, you know, uh, technical issues. There are a lot of technicalities involved, and uh, those people who are always remain on the toes. I would like to congratulate them because without them, we could not be seen, we could not be heard, we could not be do anything that we can imagine. So, uh, hats off to everybody who has who has been supporting. Um, and uh, Arif sir, over to you. Thank you so much, everybody. Arif, one uh, sentence, if you allow me. Two things. You know, sure. at last, yeah. the great women leader acknowledged the efforts of a man leader as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, one of the reasons for standing out and building, you know, asking for people to, to ask, uh, you know, to ask women to be at the leadership position because we are not. Is the no, numbers no, no. that we should be, just, you know, one of the I'm reason just, of acknowledging. I'm just pointing out that at last you acknowledge the efforts of Asif Noor. So thank you very yes. much for doing that. So, and uh, yeah, one more uh, thing, you know, we <laughs> thanked everybody, but we didn't thank our, you know, the listeners, uh, you know, the audience, the participants. So we must appreciate their patience as well. And uh, we absolutely are thrilled that um, thousands of the people, you know, were with us, and we hope that this message of hope will, you know, go to them as well. So thank you very much. Over to you, Arif. Definitely. Thank you. Right. Yes, guys, it's this is all yours before it comes to me. <laughs> yes. It's... Yeah. Yes. Thank you so very much, uh, Dr. Amjad Sagib Sab. Uh, you literally are a lighthouse of hope. It's such a privilege, it's such an honor to be able to know you and be able to work with you and to be of some support in terms of these endeavors. Uh, thank you, Arif Bhai. Thank you very much for making part of this. Farid, you did a fantastic job. You you were shining all through the program. And Shah Nasir Sahib, uh, uh, Farid is right. Thank you so much for your patience. And, and you've been fabulous in your own speech. Uh, Arif Bhai, ever since since I meet you some 24 years back, I learned one thing from you. And that was one thing which was missing in my own life. And that thing was hope. So I thought my life is uh, gonna go nowhere. And deep down some, somewhere in my heart, I believed uh, uh, and nothing positive will ever happen in my life. And you taught me one thing and for the past at least now, 18, 19 years, I've been spreading this message all over wherever I possibly could. And the message is uh, hope is not optional. And for the past uh, five months or so, uh, you and I have got this opportunity to further strengthen this message. And we've been able to uh, deliver this message to so many people. And I continue to get very positive feedback. Uh, even in the last session that we did with the VCs, many VCs were sending me the messages that we cannot thank you enough for uh, one VC, uh, Professor Ubair Sab is still watching. He just sent me the message. So this message, Alhamdulillah, is getting across and many people have been uh, positively impacted with this message. And Arif Bhai uh, and Dr. Sab, you, you remembered in the first speech that we delivered when we, we had all these trainers in the panel. So I said that this, uh, the people who do not have the sense of hope, the hopeless people or negative people, they would have this sense in, in, when, when they face crisis. They believe that this crisis is permanent, it's not going to go. You know, uh, this crisis is going to be here for the rest of our lives. And Alhamdulillah, we've been witnessing uh, that the crisis is inshallah going to get over. And we, we almost see it going and hopefully it, it won't come back. Also negative people very profoundly believe that this crisis 
is going to be pervasive, meaning this is going to impact all the other areas of their life. They might be impacted negatively in terms of their health or financials, but at least many of the parts of their lives, they were they're still intact. And we've been telling them that uh, not everything is gone. This is just one part of it. It's, it's not going to be pervasive. And the third one, we've been telling people that this is not personal. So whether you've been in, in the first world country or in a third world country, the crisis was impacting everyone um, with the same intensity and, and everybody was going through the same thing. Everybody was in the same boat. So I believe uh, with the support of Dr. Amjad Saqib Saab, we've been able to spread this message that the crisis is not permanent. This is not going to be pervasive. And this is not going to be uh, just with you. Everybody else got affected. And another side of this personal thing is that this is not because uh, because of me or because of you doing something wrong. And this is not something in terms of punishment by the almighty Allah. This is just a crisis. And we've been through this crisis for so many years. And every century, Arif and I, Arif by you particularly, wrote one of the most fabulous chapters uh, towards the end of the book that we are writing together made in crisis and you narrated the entire history if you were born in 90s and the kind of things that you went through one would believe that I'm probably not going to survive and this is going to be the end of the world so towards the end of this conversation and I'm, I'm feeling so excited and feel like speaking more I'd like to conclude uh, and would like to reinforce what Dr. Saab, uh, Dr. Amjad Saab just said that everything to me it rises and falls on leadership leadership does make the entire difference. So in, in the times of crisis, if there's, there's great good leadership, the crisis can be turned into an opportunity. But at the same time, if leadership is bad, the bad leadership has the capacity to turn even an opportunity into a crisis. Right? So we all have the responsibility uh, on our shoulders to be able to build the right kind of leaders. And well, Alhamdulillah, we've been able to do our part. Uh, in our own humble capacity. A leader's uh, view of the crisis uh, actually not only affects their own life, but because they're the leaders and many people have been following them, so their view of the crisis and the situation is actually going to impact so many lives. So it is so important for the leaders to recognize this opportunity and take the best out of this crisis. I read somewhere, never waste a crisis. So this is uh, one lifetime opportunity for the leaders to show up as, uh, as uh, great leaders and be able to make a difference. And remember the way you view things is the way you do things. So mm -hmm. we all need to change the way we've been viewing things and see a lot of positivity, uh, see a lot of hope. And we all need to keep spreading this message of hope. Thank you everybody for making me part of it once again. Thank you. Thank you so much indeed. And in just brilliant words once again. Yes, hope. We cannot get it enough. If hope is, uh, uh, if hope is a vitamin, probably we'll get it in mega doses. We need it <laughs> so much. And the good thing is that all of all of you have been providing this from Dr. Saab to to Farah to to our friend Shah Nasir and and Kasra Bas. Um, I cannot thank you enough. Um, uh, actually, yes, there are a few organizations I would like to thank them before it is over uh, for, their, for their collaboration. Um, uh, the question Dr. Sabah well, probably uh, he, 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 uh, couldn't see my message. So uh, I'm grateful uh, for organizing this Hopathan Ambassadors Congress of Hope. And there are these organizations which have played fundamentally a um, great part in making it happen. And we are indebted to them. Uh, first of all, the Hope of Pakistan, an Institute of Peace and Development, Islamabad, World Congress of Overseas Pakistanis, Human X, Possibilities, and Digitally In. We are officially grateful to each one of you. At the same time, we are grateful to, as Dr. Sam mentioned, to all the participants who have gone through this marathon transmission for more than our four and a half hours. And I wouldn't forget mentioning Professor Dr. Muhammad Naeem Khan, who is Vice Chancellor, University of Baltistan, Skirdu, uh, as he has been thoroughly uh, enjoying the session and he uh, texted many times to, to share his solidarity and support and also General Obad who has been with us throughout, uh, throughout this transmission. 
So thank you very much, all of you. And um, this transmission, as, as Kaiser mentioned, that uh, never waste a crisis. We didn't waste this crisis. This is the fourth transmission of Popathon. And we will continue with the fifth one now, hoping to bring you three of the world-class leaders in the next one in September. So till that time, you take good care of yourself. And I think all of us will do one thing today, which is special to this one. Let's raise Pakistan, Zindabad, and let me lead that. Pakistan, Zindabad. Thank you so much. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Hafiz. Hafiz. Right. Right. We have uh, Muhammad Nadim here as well. <laughs> right. We are no we longer live. Yes, I hope so. Yeah, we are no longer live. Thank you very much, Sharbai. It's such a wonderful show. I'm right, grateful. Thanks, Captain, for being here. My pleasure. Okay, Arif, right. signing off. See you soon. You finally signing off. Take care. Love is. Love is.